Can you yes. hear me now? All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jesse Hernandez over community engagement. Uh, if we can all please bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you have freely given to each of us. We ask for your presence to guide this meeting of the CPS Energy Rate Advisory Committee. Provide them with the knowledge, compassion, and wise counsel needed as the committee members discuss the business matters on the agenda today. Help us all to remember that we are stewards acting on behalf of our customers and provide us with the grace to serve all people well. We ask this in your name. Amen. So, Thank you, Jesse, Ann, are you going to do roll call now? Um, I can get the roll call off of the people off the, the call. I can do it virtually. So we're good with that. Wonderful. Chad is is running a little bit light, so we're going to skip his part and we're going to go straight into unless you have opening remarks. I do have some opening remarks. Um, I was also going to ask you if we had anybody signed up uh, for public comments. We do not. No, ma'am. Nobody signed up. Okay, great. <clears throat> then I'll just start with opening remarks and then I will turn it over to Dr. Burkwai. Um, the my. What I really wanted to do is just welcome everybody. Um, thank you for um, coming to today's uh, uh, session. I know that we, there has been a lot of uh, details and information that have been shared with you all. Uh, this has been a topic that has been uh, very close to my heart and also my work for the last 10 years. Um, and really thinking about how important that this topic is, um, to be considering in these numbers, uh, in all the considerations that we are making around the uh, current rate structure, programming, and potential future of our, our rate structure. So what I really wanted to just highlight today that this is such an important topic. It really is a, a metric that really talks to energy insecurity and the inability to be able to meet your um, uh, energy needs, financial needs. And so, um, and it really plays a part because uh, people are having to weigh, uh, you know, paying for their utility bills and what are the things that they forego, basic needs that they forego, uh, including food and medicine. And as we are facing potential disconnections of thousands of CPS residents, uh, we want to really look at um, how uh, this impact or the increase would impact um, those individuals that are most impacted already. Uh, and, and, and also the, um, ultimately who that falls upon. Uh, those individuals that are not able to pay in the face of the pandemic, um, we have been, it, this has perpetuated that issue. And so ultimately that so, still falls back on uh, the rate structure and even the um, potential rate increase um, where we're trying to recapture those financial losses. So to, it is a big part of a revenue stability as well. So think about, um, what this uh, specifically has an impact on the, the ask that we have been um, charged to do in this committee. Um, <laughs> with that said, I will turn it over to Dr. Farquhar. Thank you very much, uh, Louisa, and uh, hello, uh, RAC members. Uh, what I will be doing is giving you a summary of uh, some comparisons we have made of energy insecurity or affordability or energy burden. Uh, those are the three terms that are used as synonyms these days across the country to sort of deal with the challenging issues that Eloisa has just laid out. We will try to put the San Antonio energy burden in perspective by comparing it to other major cities within Texas and also to other cities around the country. And uh, what I will do is initially just introduce the methodology that we are using to do the computations. I will discuss the sources of data as I go along in the presentation. And then what I will do is further disaggregate the energy burden so that it now has five layers of granularity in it. Uh, I will present the energy burden by income quintile. And as I'm sure you know, uh, energy quintile or income quintile basically divides 
the distribution of income across the population into five segments, first quintile, second, third, fourth, and fifth, each representing 20% of the population of interest. So I will give you information at the aggregate level for San Antonio, compare it to other cities within Texas and elsewhere, then show you the information by income quintile. And finally, I will show you the information by census tract within the San Antonio service area. I will conclude by analyzing the impact that certain programs, the CPS Energy has in place today, to what extent are those programs helping reduce the energy burden for the forest quintile in particular, the lowest income quintile in other words, and then I'll also sh show you similar comparisons with the other quintiles. So in a nutshell, that's an overview of what I'll be presenting to you. And um, as in the past, we would very much uh, you know, uh, welcome your comments either at the end or as we are going along. And as uh, the vice chair has mentioned, you can put your questions in the chat box and I will let uh, the vice chair guide me as to when would be the best time to respond to those questions in the chat box. The second point I'm going to make is that this presentation was put together by Travis and Rohan working with me. Uh, Travis is out today. Rohan is on the call. And uh, in addition, I also have uh, Augie Rose on this call from Brattle. He is one of our principals and you have heard from him before on, on various aspects of rate design and cost of service. So I believe that's the Brattle contingent for today's meeting. The topic is assessing CPS Energy's affordability. And why don't we now get into the discussion and move on to the second slide? Thank you, Adrian. The table of contents, there will be an introduction in which I will define the concepts for you. And believe me, the definitions are not original to me. They are standard definitions that are being used around the country. And in particular, an organization called the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, or ACEEE, based in Washington, D.C., has done a lot of work on the subject. Their reports are frequently cited. So I will be referring to some of their work to set the stage. And then I will get into the data that we have obtained from primarily the federal government, from the U.S. Census and from the U.S. Energy Information Administration uh, and the American Gas Association. But those are the three primary data sources that we are using to do this comparative analysis of the energy burden faced by customers of CPS Energy. And then I'll present the information by income quintile. I will discuss how the energy burden for the particularly the lower income segments is being addressed today elsewhere in the nation. And then also, of course, by CPS Energy. And in particular for CPS Energy, I will talk about the impact that these special programs or discounts have in mitigating or ameliorating or lowering the energy burden for the low income segments within the CPS Energy Service Area. So that's the plan of action. And next, please. And by the way, in case you're wondering how many slides are in this deck, I should tell you there are about 31 slides in the deck. And initially, I will present the conceptual information that's roughly five slides, and then we'll have the other sections, roughly five slides each. So what is meant by, what is meant by the term energy insecurity? It's a very commonly used term these days. Energy insecurity is broadly defined as the inability of customers to meet their basic heating, cooling, cooking, and lighting needs. Common metrics that are used to assess affordability include, number one, the total energy bill, which is simply the sum of their 
electric cost and gas cost. We are focusing on electricity and gas in this presentation because CPS Energy provides both. So the first question is, what is their monthly energy bill, average over the year? And for all of my conversations here, except for one or two slides, I'm focusing on the data from the year 2019. Why did I pick 2019? Because it's the year before the pandemic. The pandemic created, as you know, a lot of distortions in the data, and it can certainly be revisited for 2020, but the analysis I have to share with you today is for the year 2019. So the first metric is simply the total energy bill. The second metric is the energy burden. And that's simply the ratio between their total energy bill and the household income. And then other elements are disconnection notices, how frequently are they sent to customers, how fre frequently are they actually disconnected. Another metric is foregoing necessities. And so if incomes are low and people have a concern about putting food on the table or sending their kids to school or transportation or any of those other things that life is all about, including housing and, and shopping, then what some people end up doing is really cutting drastically on some of their comfort and cooling and heating needs. That doesn't show up in the energy bill because they already have reduced it. They are now experiencing extreme discomfort, extreme inconvenience. They're experiencing hardships that are no longer captured in the energy burden because they have been forced to reduce the amount consumed beyond a healthy limit. And that's called foregoing necessities. And then part of that, of course, is unsafe or unhealthy temperatures. Like some people just turn off their air conditioner. Others may turn off their heater in the winter season. So these are last resort items that sometimes, unfortunately, segments of society are forced to resort to. And as a result of that, they have energy insecurity. The energy burden is the metric I'm going to focus on for this conversation. Why? Because it is probably the most common metric used for assessing energy insecurity. And since I'm comparing energy insecurity across jurisdictions, across cities and counties, across the United States, I had to use a metric for which the data was readily available. So that's the one I'm focusing on. Next, please. What is a high energy burden? As I mentioned, ACEEE is the, has set the standard here for what should be regarded as a high energy burden. And by looking at data for thousands of households across all the 50 states in the District of Columbia, they have concluded that if you are spending more than 6% of your income, then that is definitely a high energy burden. If you're spending more than 10%, it's a severe energy burden. And of course, uh, for a single service, the threshold is 3%. We're dealing with two services. So for the two services combined, it's 6%. For a single service, it is 3%. Now, you might be wondering, well, what are the pros and cons of the energy burden, the way I'll be discussing with you this evening? Well, among the pros, it's a simple and generally accepted as a metric throughout the country. Cons is it tends to underestimate customers experiencing a high energy burden that keep their temperatures at unsafe levels. In other words, if you are not consuming because you're concerned about the energy burden, you're managing it by sacrificing your comfort, your health, your safety, then that's not captured in the energy burden. There is, by the way, no easy way to capture it empirically with the data we have today at our disposal. I thought you should be aware of the fact that there will be some segments of society really facing hardships that may appear to have not as high an energy burden looking at these numbers than what they may actually be living through. Next, please. Energy burden varies across a number of metrics, location and geography, for example, rural versus urban, remote community versus central community. It also depends, of course, on whether they are Native Americans or island territories. It depends on climate. It depends on population density. 
It depends on a number of factors, including housing characteristics, single family versus multifamily, rental versus public housing. It depends on the socioeconomic situation, income, ethnicity, and race, and so on, number of occupants. And then, of course, there are energy prices, which has been the topic of much of the RAC conversations. Energy prices play a huge role in defining the energy burden. And then there are behavioral factors, lack of knowledge, how to manage the thermostat, lifestyle, cultural factors, lack of control over energy bills. So all of these are identified in a very nice article that you may want to consult, which is there at the link by Professor Marilyn Brown, where she has done in-depth research on what factors underlie the energy burden. So we will not go into those. I thought I would just lay out the overview. Uh, these are the reasons why the energy burden varies. And by the way, it'll also vary within a neighborhood. It might even vary between two houses next door to each other because their incomes might be different. Even though they're facing the same rates, their housing characteristics might be different. One may be insulated with high efficiency appliances. The other one may not be well insulated with low efficiency appliances. So there is a lot of variation from house to house, from zip code to zip code, from state to state, and from city to city. I'll present to you high level estimates with some granularity, and particularly a map within the CPS uh, service area showing the energy burden by census tract. Uh, but even within a tract, it's going to vary. And again, you will probably want to compute as individuals, as consumers, your own personal energy burden using the data perhaps from either 2019 or some other year. And it's very easy to do. All you need to do is you need to know what your energy bills were for the year as a whole, divide them by 12, or you can keep it at the annual level and take your income and divide it, divide the two numbers, and that's your energy burden. Next, please. The formula is very simple, and I'm just going to elaborate on a couple of elements of the formula just for you to keep in mind as we go through all of the charts that follow. So the annual energy burden is the annual amount spent on electricity added to the annual amount spent on gas divided by annual household income. What is the annual electricity cost comprised of? is the price of electricity times the quantity of electricity consumed. What is the gas cost? Same concept, price of gas times the quantity of gas consumed. So what would cause the energy burden to be higher? Two things, price of electricity being higher will raise it. Quantity of electricity consumed will raise it. Household income being lower will also raise it because it is the denominator. So higher consumption and higher prices and lower income result in a higher energy burden. And that's what's shown in the little cartoon we have towards the bottom of the chart. Okay. Next, please. So how are we going to approach this from the CPS energy perspective? We're going to establish data sources. But before I go into the data sources, let me tell you what cities we're looking at. Of course, we're looking at San Antonio, and we're looking at Bear County. Income data is only available to us at the county level. So for each of these cities that are listed here, we have identified the counties for which we are getting the data. And the U.S. Census Bureau is our source for providing income data at a county level. And then we had to identify the relevant utilities or retail providers. In the case of Dallas and Houston, we are looking at TXU Energy and Reliant Energy Retail Services, respectively. And for Austin, of course, it is Austin Energy. And then I have listed all of the other utilities as well. For Jacksonville, it is JEA or Jacksonville Electricity Authority. Okay. So that, that chart is something we can come back to. Uh, just keep that in mind. I'll mention a couple of other factors. Uh, basically, what we are going to do is, as I mentioned to you on the previous page, 
we'll have the average electric bill plus the average gas bill for the year as a whole divided by the annual income for that service area. So initially we'll be showing you aggregate data for all customers together, and then we will break it down into the quintiles. Next, please. So zeroing in now for a moment, uh, what we're going to do is show you a time series beginning in the year 2010 and running to the year 2019. And on the, so I'm showing you two charts here. Let me go through them one at a time. The chart on the left shows the energy burden in the year 2019 across these various service areas. So the first bar is the US average, and then it's New York, Ohio, Georgia, California, and then Texas. And then within Texas, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. Customers that live in Austin and California experience the lowest energy burden. And you will see later on as to why that is the case. They have higher incomes. And at least in California, they have lower consumption, but high prices. So energy burdens have trended downwards. So now looking at the chart on the right, from 4.2% in 2010 to 3.2% in 2019 in the US as a whole. And then looking at San Antonio, from 3.6% in 2010 down to 2.8% in 2019. So that's sort of the left hand side is the cross section in the year 2019 across the jurisdictions, and the right hand side is the trend in time. In general, energy burdens have been declining at different rates, but declining nevertheless. So that's just one point of reference for you to keep in mind. And the data sources are all listed down below. As I mentioned earlier, is the Energy Information Administration for Electricity, the Annual Gas Association for Data on Gas, and the income data is coming from the U.S. Census Bureau. Next, please. So let's dive into some of the details. Average residential customers, monthly energy bills are shown here. Gas is the amount at the top in the light uh, greenish color and electricity is at the bottom. On average, CPS customers, their energy bill has a large share going to electricity not much going to gas. 85% of the bar chart for San Antonio is dark blue, and that's for electricity. CPS customer bills are 10% and 20% lower than the national and Texas state averages, respectively. Energy customers in Dallas, New York, and Houston incur the highest energy bills relative to other benchmarks. And again, keep in mind, this is just the numerator of the energy burden. The denominator is the income, and then you take the ratio, and that's the energy burden. So this is just the numerator. And I'm showing you both electric and gas combined, just to keep it comparable to uh, the, the CPS metrics, CPS energy metrics. Next, please. All right, so now let's focus on the denominator of that ratio. It's the annual median household income by county. And uh, the counties are listed there for your reference. And on the right side, they're showing the median incomes across the jurisdictions. And you will see that San Antonio's number is a tad lower than Dallas and Houston, but significantly lower than Austin. Austin's income, as I mentioned earlier, is on the high side, and it compares with California's income. New York is next, and the U.S. average is the next number then. Okay. You take the ratio of the energy bill to the income, and you get the energy burden. So I've shown you the numerator now and the denominator. Next, please. So 
So the numerator was the amount you spend on, on energy, which is comprised of electric expenditures and gas expenditures. The electric expenditures are comprised of the price of electricity times the quantity of electricity. The same is going to be true for gas. So let's focus first on electricity. And on the left side, we're showing you the consumption data. Texas County is on the right side, and you will notice the CPS residential customers consume the fifth highest amount of electricity relative to all of the others in the sample. And that's something we have noticed for some time that consumption tends to be on the higher side in San Antonio. And obviously it's driven, I assume, uh, by climate. It's probably also driven by the sizes of the houses and the number of occupants in the houses is probably also determined driven by the efficiency of the insulation in those houses and the efficiencies of the appliances in those houses. If you look at the right side, it's showing prices now, and it is very clear that CPS residential consumers have the lowest electricity rates in this particular sample. So they have the lowest rates on the right side or on the left side, they have the fifth highest consumption. And the product of those two is going to give us the uh, electricity bill, which uh, we showed you in the previous slide. Next, please. And now we're looking at natural gas. So due to a warmer climate, the average CPS residential customer consumes about 50% less gas than the national average. And uh, it is by far the lowest in the country. On the right hand side, we're showing prices. And again, what we're finding is that they have the lowest gas prices as well in San Antonio. And that was also true for electricity, as you might recall. So the gas picture is consistent with the electricity picture in terms of prices being lower, the lowest. But the consumption is not. Uh, they consume the lowest amount of gas, but they do not consume the lowest amount of electricity. And keep in mind that 85% of the bill is coming from electricity. So again, this is a very, very basic factual information coming from various government sources. Uh, this is for averages or aggregates of customers. We will get into the quintiles a, a bit later on. Next, please. So now comes the question of how does energy affordability differ by income level? As I mentioned earlier, we're going to use the quintile concept here. You could also do deciles, uh, you could do percentiles, but it becomes really uh, an overload. So quintiles is widely used. Divide the population income data into five layers. The first quintile is the lowest and it includes 20% of the population at the low end of the distribution. At the other end is the fifth quintile, which has the 20% at the upper end of the distribution. And then second, third, and fourth fall in between. So what we're going to do is we're going to use data on income and at the quintile level to probe the question of how is the energy burden for these different Look, localities differing by quintiles. And before I move forward, let me pose a question to you just to ponder. Would you expect that the energy burden will vary by income quintile? That's my first question for you to think over. And the second question is, where do you think the energy burden will be higher? Would it be the fifth quintile or would it be the first quintile? Okay. So just just uh, uh, just think about those questions, and I'll I'll give you the answers very shortly. Next slide, please. So first of all, let's look at how incomes vary across the various Texas cities, and they are shown here. Uh, San Antonio, the blue bar on the left in each quintile, Austin the second bar, Dallas the third bar, Houston the fourth bar. So at every income quintile, 
households in San Antonio are poorer on average than households in Austin, Dallas, and Houston. In other words, the bar on the very left with each quintile, the Prussian blue color is always the lowest. The average third income quintile household in San Antonio earns 73% of the average counterpart household in Austin. The average fifth income quintile in San Antonio earns two thirds of the, uh, the counterpart in Austin and 80% as much as the average. So Austin clearly, there's more income in Austin is followed by Dallas and Houston and then by San Antonio. So the challenge for San Antonio energy burden is prices might be lower but energy consumed is higher or electricity, which is the dominant source of the energy burden and incomes are lower. So that almost guarantees that the energy burdens will be higher by quintile for San Antonio. And, and let's, let's see if that is indeed the case by going to slide 14. So, we are now going to also step back a little bit and bring in cities from across the US. And keep in mind, we are looking at several cities that are shown here as the additional bars. Atlanta, Baltimore, Jacksonville, Florida, Los Angeles, Orlando, Phoenix, and Stockton. Those were chosen through discussions between our team and CPS Energy's team, our clients. And we can certainly add or subtract other cities later on if there is interest, of course, not today, but data is available for all of the relevant metropolitan areas that you might have an interest in. But we thought these 11 are, are quite sufficient. And as you can see, the bar chart is already quite cluttered. So let me summarize the key points. Out of the 11 cities surveyed, Jacksonville, Florida's income distribution most closely matches San Antonio's. Fourth and fifth income quintile households in Atlanta and Austin were wealthier on average than similar households in the other surveyed cities. Across all 11 surveyed cities, the income interval means of households in the first and second income quintiles were less than 50,000. In other words, people in these first and second quintiles on average are making less than $50,000. Many of them are living at the poverty line or lower. I mean, this is where really the hardship is concentrated when it comes to the energy burden. But keep in mind, energy is not the only thing in their life, right? Clothing, food, shelter, transportation, education, maybe some entertainment. They're all activities that they have to spend money on. And so it's very tight squeeze when you're making, let's say $29,000 and every penny counts. So we will come back to how the energy burden can be reduced for people who are unfortunately in the lower income quintiles. And we'll get to that towards the end of the discussion. 15, please, slide, next slide. So now comes the part which is a bit tricky how do we estimate the energy burden by income quintile? No source out there provides that information to us. We had to do a lot of detailed analysis and reworking of the data in order to get there. We had to look at a data source that so far we have not looked at, but for this slide we had to. It's called a REX. It stands for Residential Energy Consumption Survey, RECS. And uh, it is, of course, carried out by the Energy Information Administration every, I believe, every five years. So we have the RECS from 2015, and it provides electricity and gas consumption by income level and region. So we are using information there to construct or to impute the energy spending by quintile using some proportionality assumptions. And once we have done that, then we are able to compute the energy burdens by income quintile. This is a bit of a technical sidebar. Let's come back to it later on, depending on interest. 
Next, please. Average electricity prices across various Texas cities. Just to put things in perspective, this is for 2019. San Antonio is 11 cents for households, all in rolled in price. And it is 14 cents for Dallas and Houston. So San Antonio is lower. When compared with full service, meaning bundled, Across the US, we find that households in San Antonio pay 16% less on a per kilowatt hour basis for electricity than their counterparts in the US. So basically 11 cents versus 12 and a half cents for the US as a whole. Now, I will mention California a few times and you will see some data on California. As I mentioned earlier, their prices are higher than the national average, the consumption is lower. Uh, California is, is really expensive in many, many dimensions, including the price of electricity. The number, so, so I live in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, the average for me, and, and you might be shocked at this, is around uh, 28 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So in, in some ways, living in San Antonio, has uh, given you access to much, much less expensive electricity than if you were to move to California. Hawaii is even more expensive. Next, please. So now here is the national picture. San Antonio households face the lowest electricity prices, and I mentioned that previously. Now I'm showing you the prices by the various cities. And you will see Los Angeles, which is a municipal utility, the largest in the country. 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Stockton in the Central Valley, about an hour from my house, um, served by Pacific Gas and Electric Company, an investor on utility. Their number is, is roughly speaking 23 cents uh, in this chart. It has gone up quite a bit since the chart was put together. This is using the same point of reference, the year 2019 for all the cities. Next slide, please. And this is similar data for natural gas prices. Once again, San Antonio prices for gas are lower than the others, as you can see. Next, please. And here we are comparing them to several other cities. Uh, there is a data problem for Atlanta, so that's, uh, I, I guess we had put an asterisk that somehow got removed. That is not the correct number. It's an incomplete data set. So as, as mentioned in the text on the left, so just, just ignore that for comparison purposes. Um, there were some real issues getting data from uh, Atlanta Gas and Light Company uh, in terms of public domain information. But the, the, the general point I'm going to make and leave with you is that San Antonio's gas prices are significantly lower than gas prices elsewhere. And Orlando and Jacksonville here have the highest gas prices. California has not the highest gas prices. And that, by the way, just a sidebar and a tangent for those of you who are studying electrification in heat pumps and wondering why there are so few heat pumps in California. The simple answer is because electricity is so much more expensive than gas in California. Next slide, please. So using the methodology that I described a few slides ago, here are the energy bills by city and income quintile. And you will see that on average households in Dallas and Houston face higher estimated energy bills than those in San Antonio and Austin, regardless of income quintile. Keep in mind, I'm now showing you information by income quintile. The difference in energy bills is primarily driven by the fact that households in Dallas and Houston face significantly higher electricity bills. And um, incomes are not that different. So uh, you will see when we get to the energy burden, their energy burdens will be higher. Next, please. By contrast, when you put all the cities in there, the 11 cities that we have, 
the conclusion the San Antonio households face comparatively lower energy bills is still true, whether you just look within Texas or you look nationwide. Next, please. So now comes sort of the bottom line, is what is the energy burden by income quintile, right? That's what we have been waiting for. And we are showing here, San Antonio as the left bar in Prussian blue, followed by Austin, Dallas, and Houston. For a moment, let me ask you to just look at the first set of bars that correspond to the first income quintile. And keep in mind that the red dashed line is the 6% threshold defined by ACEEE. So the first income quintile households in all four Texas areas are above 6%. You go to the second income quintile, and only Dallas is slightly above that threshold. San Antonio is lower, Austin is even lower. You go to the third income quintile, which you can kind of think of as the median of the population. And you will see now the numbers, like for San Antonio, at 3%. You go to the fourth, and the numbers for San Antonio are even lower, as you would expect, because incomes are higher. And the fifth, it's even lower. So this gives you both a comparison across the quintiles as well as across the cities. The first income quintile is where there's a real challenge and a real hardship in San Antonio, but also in the two other major metropolitan areas of Dallas and Houston. Next, please. So low-income households in San Antonio face a 9.7% energy burden. But if you look at some of the others in those other urban areas, you will see some of them are even higher than 12% and some are lower. So San Antonio really doesn't stand out here as being particularly burdened when you compare it to the other cities. I'm not saying there is no burden. There is a burden. It's a severe burden. It's above 6%. But in a comparative sense, there are cities where it's even worse, considerably worse. And, uh, and then you can see all the information across the different income quintiles for the 11 cities. I hope- Ahmed, Ahmed yeah. hang on a minute. I, Didi has a question here in the room. Please. It's okay. It's, it's not a question. It's more of a comment. I'm very, very bothered when we say, you know, compared to other low-income customers, we're not doing so bad. 9.7% is not good. And we are going to raise rates on our customers not in Dallas, not in uh, Jacksonville. We're, we're talking about San Antonio. So I don't want to be dismissive of that 9.7% because that's, 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 a, that's a high energy burden. And I want to know, like, we can go through all this data um, and, and compare ourselves to other cities and say that we're doing so much better, but we're not. Like, you can look at other reports that say we're not, and I don't, I don't want to say, hey, we're doing all right because we're only 9.7% compared to 10%. What I want to know is what are we going to do for those customers that are just absolutely poor here in San Antonio that are facing not only high energy burden, but energy insecurity. What impact is this rate increase going to have on those folks? What bill impact? is it gonna have on those folks? That's what I want us to consider as we go through slide after slide saying, you know, San Antonio natural gas price, you know, we consume less natural gas than other areas. And I do wanna ask a question about that. Is could, could the fact that CPS Energy subsidizes natural gas appliances have an impact on, the, on that consumption? Like there's rebates for natural gas appliances. 
So anyway, I, I wasn't, that was a question, but I, I do, I just want people to understand like how I feel my role here as, as an organizer, as somebody who had to turn off her electricity in college and growing up um, and knowing people that still have to do that because they cannot afford their electricity bill. Like, that's what I want to talk about. And all right, that's it. Didi, thank you very much. I actually fully agree with what you're saying. And let me just, uh, if I am allowed to say a few words in response. So the first thing I would say is the 9.7% is very severe energy burden. I do not mean to minimize the importance of that statement. It is higher than 6%. 6% is a high energy burden. And in, anything above that, approaching 10%, is a severe energy burden. I was simply making the point that with reference to other metropolitan areas, it is still lower. It's just a factual statement. It is not a recommendation that the 9.7% should be accepted. It should be lowered, and we will discuss as I get later towards the end of the slide, what can be done and what is being done elsewhere around the country to lower the energy burden, particularly for the first quintile. The second comment I'll make, and I think, I hope you will see it resonates with what you were just saying towards the end, that the energy burden potentially underestimates the actual miserable burden that customers have. They are curtailing their use by becoming uncomfortable, potentially unsafe by turning off their air conditioner or their space heater, or potentially lights or even unplugging their refrigerator sometimes to lower that energy burden. Unfortunately, that is not measured in the data I have. As I mentioned in the first part of my presentation, there are pros and cons of using the energy burden statistic, but it remains the most widely used metric because it can be quantified. Let me make a third statement, which is every step should be considered by the RAC and by the CPS energy management team and I, I guess all of the governing authorities in, in that area to try to mitigate the impact on the lowest income segment of the rising prices that you just referenced. I have been working with several utilities around the country in the last six months on what can they do to mitigate the effect of the upcoming rate hikes on customers' affordability. And not to give the sure away, but just not to prolong the suspense, they're doing two things, and I would recommend highly that San Antonio CPS Energy consider those two things. The first one is provide them more of a discount, and we will discuss the discounts currently being provided in other states, other jurisdictions. But I'll put the San Antonio discounts in perspective. So raise the discounts for the lowest income segment, number one. Number two, find a way to lower the quantity consumed without making them uncomfortable. In other words, do more energy efficiency, more weatherization. In California, low-income households are actually getting their appliances replaced for free with more efficient appliances. Who is paying for that? The other customers. But it's a decision, a policy decision that the state's commission has made. So there are more radical steps that are worth considering. And, and related to that, my understanding is currently $70 million is being spent annually on the STEP program, of which 20 million is devoted to the low income customers. Maybe the 20 million should be 35 million. And for people in the higher income brackets, that number, instead of being 50 million out of the 70, should be lowered to 35. Again, I am just making general comments. I have no authority in this conversation other than as a consultant, just throwing out ideas for the RAC and CPS energy management to consider. And we can come back to those during the open q and I, I really appreciate your making those comments, Didi, and I hope I didn't come across as insensitive to the challenges faced by the low-income segments. Next slide, please. So we were asked to look at the census tracts energy burdens. In 2019, 
the city of San Antonio had 366 census tracts. And we were able to get income distribution data for 358 of those. We segmented the 358 census tracts for which we had income data into five groups. We put, we created three groups with 72 each, two with 71 each. And what we're going to show you now is some information in a table and then in a map. So the income quintiles, the five quintiles, the energy bills that we have estimated here are shown. They range from 1326 for the first quintile to 2289 in the fifth quintile. Obviously, the income rises as you go through the quintiles. The challenge now is how to put that in a map so that the information is not just by quintile, but by tracks. Next slide, please. So this is um, something that uh, Travis, who is not here today with us, uh, was able to create using GIS uh, technology along with the sources of data. And what we're showing here is sort of the map of San Antonio by census tract. And what you will see is two graphs here. The one on the left is the first income quintile. You will see the colors, the darker the red, the higher the energy burden. And this is for Bear County. And uh, the southern part, of San Antonio has significantly higher challenges when it comes to energy burdens than the northern part. And I am sure you can relate to it much more so than I can sitting here. I've been to San Antonio maybe three times, but probably mostly just uh, in the city areas along the river walk for a conference. The average energy burden, just to put a comparison point here, is on the right side. So it's it, it's it's still you know, more so in the southern areas and to, to some extent in the central areas, but the colors are really very different and diluted in the average chart on the right than they are in the first income quintile on the left. Next, please. So average energy burdens by census tract and quintile. Um, what we have, we have divided up the tracks into, uh, you know, uh, San Antonio average. By quintile, that's the first bar, the Prussian blue. And then you have the information by track, which is the most burden, followed by second most, third, least, et cetera. Yeah. And you will see how the information varies within a particular quintile by track. The most burdened shown in the first income quintile, have a horrendous energy burden approaching 27%. And Didi, maybe that's the point of reference you had in mind. Uh, and then the next one over is 12.5%. The third one, which is kind of like the median for the first, for the first quintile, is that nine point something number that you had seen previously. So there's a lot of variation, as I mentioned to you, within the first quintile. And if we were doing this analysis by deciles, which are 10%, 20%, 30%, you would see even more vividly what the results would look like. So instead of five quintiles, we'd have 10 deciles. And it's very possible that some people in the very lowest segments have an energy burden approaching 40 to 50%. So that's what this granularity in the data has revealed. Very challenging situation for the lowest quintiles. And within the census tracts that are the most burden, almost a third of the household income is going to energy. Next, please. So now we turn to the policy issues. What can be done to lower the energy burden? Financial incentives, retrofit subsidies, tax credits, weatherization, all of these are being used. Focusing specifically on low income households to address the energy burden challenge. 
You may have heard of all of these programs that are shown on the left, or some of them might be new to you. In the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on them. This is just a quick snapshot from the US Department of Energy. And, and then let's go to the next slide. So the federal program worth mentioning is LIHEAP, and um, it's there everywhere. Uh, it has limited funding, but it, it's there. People take advantage of that. Then you have New Jersey's, they have a universal service fund. Uh, California, with which I'm most familiar, <coughs> has a program called CARE. California Alternate Rates for Energy. It's a straightforward discount of the energy bill. 35% for electricity and 20% for natural gas. Eligibility is based on total household income. 52,400 for a size of four. And, and then there are some other programs that provide additional support. Again, each state has its own combination of measures. The state of Washington just passed legislation that will introduce discounts in the state of Washington as high as 100% for the very lowest percent of the low income customer population. So if you're in the very lowest, the 20% of the low income population, you will get roughly 100% discount, which means it will be free. Okay? And then it cascades up uh, to um, numbers like 20% at the top end. Okay? So there is no doubt that these programs are the most targeted programs to reduce the energy burden of the low income segments. And just mentioning California, Washington details I don't have, but I can get those if, if those are of interest to folks uh, later on. Next, please. So um, these incentives have their limitations. Uh, Low-income homeowners, for example, in order to encourage them to buy efficient appliances, they don't have the money. They don't have the financial standing to get a loan. So the utility in other areas uh, sometimes will offer them zero interest loans to help them buy the new appliances and replace them. As I said, in California, the appliances are being replaced for free. So, uh, so those are some Obviously, the money has to come from somewhere, so I keep repeating it because it's just a reminder that no utility out there is able to print the currency that resides with the U.S. government. So the utility has to take it from the other customer. It's a reallocation of income being carried out by the utility when these discounts are being put forward. Next, please. So CPS Energy already is doing a fair bit. Um, as you know, and I'm just uh, putting this up here as a reminder, and then I'll show you the impacts these programs are having on the energy burden. So there is uh, uh, the Affordability Discount Program, or ADP. There is the REAP Program, Energy Assistance Partnership. And then there is the STEP Program for Energy Efficiency. I'm sure all of you know this, but just uh, uh, to make sure that we are all on the same page, ADP participants can save a maximum of $12.30 a month, $147 a year. The REAP program, they can receive a maximum of $400 per year to pay for their electric uh, cooling, electric air conditioning, or heating bills. And then there is the STEP program, which you are very familiar with, which I already mentioned earlier. Um, so let's go to the next slide and see what impact of these programs had thus far before the rate increase we're talking about kicks in, what impacts has it had? So what we see is that these programs, so what I'm showing here, just to put things in perspective, the blue bar is the energy burden for the first income quintile for CPS Energy's customer. Then you'll, you'll recall that number is 9.7%. So if that customer participates in the ADP program, it'll go down from 9.7% to a little over 8%. 
If they participate in the REAP program, it will go down much more to a number of around roughly approaching 7%. If they participate in the STEP program as it currently exists, it won't go down that much as the other two. Now, if you combine the programs, and some of them can be combined, but all three cannot, as I understand it, you combine ADP and STEP, and now the number is just a little over 8%. You combine REAP and STEP, and the number is almost at, three, at 6%. Now, this may not appear to be sufficient to you as RAC members. And then the question would be how, what steps to take to further lower it? And in particular, as the rate increase that we are discussing um, becomes a reality, what additional steps should be taken to make sure that it stays around the 6% number? And that's my last slide. I'm going to pause here and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. If uh, uh, Eloisa is the vice chair, if you want to set things in perspective and make some opening remarks, uh, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to, to respond in whatever way you think would be useful. Thank you. Um, I am thinking that I'm gonna start with um, opening the Florida questions. Um, I do have quite a few questions myself. I, I will wait, um, but at least let's start a first round. And for um, as we, um, I think I'll start with the individuals that are on the call. But what I realize is that you haven't, you kind of stopped at the slide 31, but you did provide a lot of additional slides as well. And so I, I just want to also reference that for everybody else. Uh, there are some additional slides that were not covered in the presentation. So let's start with any potential uh, questions from the team. If you could uh, raise your hand, put your name in the, actually put your name in the chat so that way I can just call on you um, uh, according to the chat. If for some reason you don't have access to the chat and you are joining us virtually, um, could you, uh, I'm going to ask you just to speak up. Um, and and then I, I I will have you and we can call on you. Once we go through those that are virtual, I am going to work with Anne to actually uh, identify those that are in the room um, to speak, and then we'll we will get through that first round and then kind of come back around. So with this presentation, is there anybody? Um, uh, I don't see any names virtually. Is there anybody virtually who had any questions or comments? Yeah, this is Wayne Eddington. Uh, I've appreciated all the information here. What this is showing me week after week after week is how good a job the CPS has done to keep the rates low. In the military, we did what they call cut the fat. And we got to a point that we couldn't cut any more fat. We were down to the bone. Either we're going to keep the leg or we're going to get rid of it. And so I, I'm not sure where we are yet because we keep talking about ways of fixing things, but we still haven't seen the problem. I say the same thing over and over. Uh, it, you see the data like in California, and I haven't been out there in a while, but a lot of places didn't have air conditions, you know, because of the climate. Over in the LA area and stuff, we didn't have air conditions in the condos or anything like that. So there's a lot of factors as the gentleman was saying about going into numbers. Now, I've heard, okay, well, the tenants and the burden and this, I made a mistake one time of paying the utilities for the tenant. I went by there when they wasn't there. The air condition was on 68. Every light in the house was on. All the ceiling fans were on and, 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 and so on because they didn't have to pay anything. So I'm listening to all of this, but I still haven't heard the impact of what's in this 10% raise we're talking about. Uh, two nights ago on the news, they said that, oh, it's not going to be as bad. It's going to be an 8%. And I said, well, I'm on the rack and I don't even know what they're talking about. But the point is, is that we have a 10% deficit. And the question is, is what's going to be left off if we don't do the 10%? So we can talk about all the other things, but I'm sorry, I like to go to the wall and my lights turn on. And I don't want my lights turned off because someone 
that quote unquote supposedly not be able to pay their bill. And once again, I go buy the houses. Their TVs are larger than the TVs in your house. They got Michael Jordan tennis shoes at $150. We could go on and on and on on that, but we haven't even got to that yet. What is, what, what are we, are, are we going to uh, be vulnerable for cybersecurity if we don't upgrade the computers in this 10%? What is the problem? Why, what do we need in this 10% that we're not seeing? And so once again, you know, I, I enjoy seeing the data across the country. I enjoy seeing all these items, but we still haven't focused on San Antonio. If we don't do the 10%, what are we gonna lose? Are we gonna lose a fourth of the power? They've cut manpower down to 3000, but you see construction going the whole time. So my point is, is that when are we gonna get to say, Okay, based on what y'all saying, this is how much the income we're gonna raise, and this is what the problems that we have to solve. And then, okay, well, fine. Well, maybe we don't think that upgrading the computer is important. But what is the what what is the issues that we're trying to solve, other than just well, do we raise the rates or not? What's the purpose? Why are we doing this? So once again, I would love to see how much money they are talking about raising, and what the money is going to be spent on. And then we can have a discussion on how to do that. And then we can go on the low income. We can go on those things. But until we do that, what are we doing? So once again, I say the same thing. I think CPS has done a great job because they, you can see in the charts, we're low everywhere. But it comes time where you can't trim fat anymore. There's no more fat. So what are we missing? What, are we, what, are we, what do we need to do to solve? What problems do we need to solve? in order to have this 10%. If we don't have the 10%, what are we gonna go without? Thank you very much. Uh, do, do you want me to comment? So Ali, Ali said, there are two aspects of Wayne's question that I can address, but the bulk of what he was saying, I think is directed at CPS Energy's management. I'm happy to comment on the two issues that I think fall in my uh, presentation context. So reference to California, Los Angeles not having much air conditioning, yes, it's on the coast, but the city we are using is Stockton. Stockton, as you know, Wayne, is in the heart of the Central Valley. I live just an hour away, I'm 35 miles east of San Francisco. We have tons of air conditioning. There is no doubt in my mind that our climate in the summer is not too different from CPS San Antonio's climate. But yes, you average it for all of California, you get a different story. So that's just a minor comment on you know, the California comparison question. The second uh, comment I can make, uh, if I might, is that in the analysis that I have shown you today, working with Rohan and Augie and Travis, and by the way, my colleague team member Rohan is now visible to us. Uh, he's absolutely spectacular genius. He, he crunched the math where I thought it could not be crunched. What I was going to say is if you want, just as a hypothetical, we can run, rerun the math with a 10% rate hike or an 8% rate hike for San Antonio and tell you how the graphs will look like and then discuss ways to mitigate that impact. So again, that's numerically something we can do. We have the machine, we can just run it as a, another scenario. But in terms of the other bigger question that you have posed is, I, I like the metaphor, you know, cutting to the bone. Uh, can, can it be cut anymore or is 10% needed? I, I think somebody, from CPS Energy uh, probably needs to address that question because we have not been assisting them on that particular issue. Hey, hey, uh, Louisa, if you don't mind, this is Rudy. Can you hear me okay? Okay, Wayne, I, I really appreciate your question. Um, we have been working really hard to try to get, you know, um, our engagement with the community, you know, going on um, you know, the potential need for a rate increase. And uh, we've been talking 10%. That was always kind of a working number. Um, you know, this week, I can tell you, I have been in no less than 10 meetings with uh, city staff looking at our assumptions that drive what the number is for a rate case, challenging ourselves to make sure that we're thinking about um, what we know versus what we don't know um, and, and, and really trying to hone in on um, you know, on alignment, you know, because ultimately, you know, our, our, our owner has to, uh, you know, to a certain degree agree with what we're uh, projecting in terms of capital spend, in terms of labor, in terms of how our cost drivers are going up on the O&M side. Uh, and so, 
Um, so that 10% was always an estimate, and I know it's created a lot of confusion uh, on the rack. Um, we are working to get alignment, and, and um, I think we've made a lot of progress this week. And so as we proceed forward with conversations with our board and, um, you know, and, and certainly the city council, um, you know, we really want to make sure that the city, uh, that, that, that we're working with our city owners um, on, you know, on, on what the total package looks like. And so uh, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I think uh, the number continues to evolve. Um, we, you know, we're going to, we're going to stop talking about 10% and uh, really focus in on, on getting alignment before we kind of come back with some, you know, some, some hard numbers on where we're at. Uh, but it's part of the process. I know the RAC uh, has been asked to weigh in. I think we're still on the trajectory of trying to get this ironed out by uh, by January, uh, but we're working real hard to make sure that we provide, um, you know, we provide certainty to the community on on what this ask is, and there's a process to go about doing that. You know, up to now, our goal has been to try to flash this to the community so they know there's a need, and as we align with with the city on the analysis it takes to get there, and, and that's really where we are. We've had uh, we're we're we are fully engaged right now. In that, in that due diligence process, and uh, and I think um, as soon as uh, as we feel comfortable that we're in alignment with our owner, I think we'll we'll, we'll move forward in a thoughtful manner. Uh, thank you, Rudy. Thank you very much for, for, I'm sorry. Th thank you for your comments, and, and and I'm not disparaging what anyone is doing. I'm just saying, you know, we're talking about we need to raise money, but we haven't figured out what we're raising money for. It may need to be 12 or 15 percent, but we don't know what we're going to cut you know whereas we say hey if we go up 10 percent, but we're not going to have cyber security well we might think cyber security is worth going to 12 percent than have the 10 but we don't have anything to to, to balance it by is all i'm trying to say so I, i'm not trying to disparage the briefings have been great for comparison process and i understand that and like you compare to your neighbor next door you can do all kind of comparisons but the bottom line is what are you willing to do it out in your household in order to have certain things and not have certain things and, and right now that's the only thing that i'm asking uh, i don't care if it's 12 percent or 15 percent. it's just that you know is that going to cover all of our needs and i still just don't know what the needs are is all i'm trying to say you know yes, and, and 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 and, that, and it's two trains i mean y'all can keep on that other train that's fine but but we really need in my opinion I, you know i would like to know what are the requirements why are we raising 10 percent? what are we lacking what are we going to do without if we don't do the 10 percent until we get to that point to me it's hard to look at rates and rates and rates and what everybody else is doing and but we don't know what they're doing in their area and like you know and all and all but what do we need to do in san antonio do so is that going to put us have, have the best utility company in the world if we go to 10 percent or are we just kind of catching up by going 10 percent and we're going to do something later i just don't know that's all i'm saying but thank you yeah, for yeah. your comment and i agree with everything that you said and I agree with the briefer, so don't. I'm not trying to throw stones at anybody. I think everybody's done a great job. I'm just saying that if we're gonna compare stuff, let's get something to compare it to. What are we gonna do without if we only do a five percent raise, for example? So Thank you. that's all I'm asking. Thank you. Do, do, do you mind if I take a shot at that? Uh, Thank you yeah. for your comments, Corey. Did you want to respond? Yeah, if you don't mind, sorry. I, I yes, I before you do that, Kurt, I see you raising your hand. I, uh, after Corey's comments, I'm going to turn it over to Al, then Norman, and then Kurt. Go for thank it, you. Corey. Thank, thank you so much. So, so yeah, you know, I, I actually hopped on halfway through Rudy's answer, um, but it sounded like you were asking Wayne, you know, what are we going to spend the dollars on? And it's a great question. And I think regardless of what the number is, there's some key themes that we really want to make sure folks are aware of. And, and in fact, the reason I was late, I was over at the city having conversations with them about these needs. Um, specifically, when it comes to expenses, um, the types of investments that San Antonio needs are a few. One, the regular uh, core business that you expect us to do, the cost of doing th that type of work is has gone up significantly. So just the regular type of reliability and resiliency. Layer on top of that, Wayne, um, all of the recommendations from this summer from the Committee of Emergency Preparedness, and there are additional investments in uh, resiliency and reliability that are part of the budget. The question that we're really asking ourselves that we're, we're scrubbing right now is, what are the, the, the right types of investments to make and when? 
And that's where a lot of the conversation is. And then the other items really are around um, the technology that underpins um, our system. We've talked about how a lot of our systems are maybe over 20 years old. There's a need for investment. We recognize that. The question that we're challenging ourselves on in terms of assumptions is, um, you know, is the timing for this, you know, now or is it is it 12 or 15 months from now? These are the types of discussions that we're balancing. Um, but they're all around um, resiliency, reliability, and this investment in technology that supports it. And then ultimately, um, who gets all the work done? People get the work done. So we've talked about staffing levels and having the right level of staffing. We've talked about how we have um, a large portion of our workforce eligible for retirement. Um, what does the future employee of, of CPS Energy look like? How much do we realistically think we can uh, hire in a given time frame? These are the types of assumptions that we're actually challenging uh, ourselves and having the conversations with the city. But those are the types of things I think I hear you asking about that we'll continue to share more about um, because I think those are really important. And the last, the last assumption that I think we want to look at again here locally is what is what is what is growth revenue growth really look like? I mean, we're making assumptions about how our folks are using uh, power. Is it is it going to keep trending down? Is it leveling off? What's the impact of COVID? All fair assumptions for uh, folks to to have. Sorry, I didn't have my camera on. Um, all fair assumptions, and again, those are the types of assumptions Rudy's talking about that we're going back challenging ourselves on. So hopefully, Wayne, that gives you a little more color because I, 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 I heard you asking about what are we spending on and what's important, as opposed to just how do we compare to other cities, which you know they're both important. But but I get it. We're citizens here. We want to know what's that investment here. What are we going to do without, or 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 not do without. So anyways, hopefully it gives a little more color. I love the question. Happy to talk more about it um, at any other time. Uh, thank you, Eloisa, for allowing me to, to answer. Thank you, Corey. And Wayne, I appreciate you repeating that question again. I think our next uh, session, I, I am hoping that CPS is actually going to answer that question with more than just kind of the narrative, but actually give give. Uh, those actual details to come. So appreciate Corey, you having that kind of a uh, high level and um, look forward to actually looking at that data in the future. We are talking about energy burden today. Um, so I do know that CPS, there are a lot of questions that have not been answered and we uh, ex are expecting CPS to kind of dive in deeper to a lot of those questions on our next call as well. Um, I want to turn it over to Al uh, for your questions. Thank you, they are, you are next. My question is on the, uh, on the RECs, on the RECS. Uh, 2015 numbers were referenced. Uh, why not 2020 if it's done every five years? And also on the gas prices, um, their reference to 2019 numbers are referenced. Uh, what's the best guess on current prices uh, considering uh, the price increases? Uh, what's the effect on the charts uh, presented, uh, specifically the, the energy burden? A good question. Uh, so, Rohan, are you uh, able to uh, participate? Uh, I, I think those two questions were, uh, why did we not use the RECs for 2020? And uh, what is the situation going to look like for gas prices in particular, if you were to use the current gas prices? Yes. Um, can everyone have, hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So we did not use the 2020 RECs because those uh, results are not publicly available yet. Uh, we expect, um, based on how the EIA has con uh, conducted this before, it'll probably be available sometime in 2022. Um, and in response to the gas prices question, um, it's, so for CPS Energy uh, in 2019, residential gas prices were uh, approximately 75 cents per 100 cubic feet. Um, with the, uh, there is uh, no current information. So there's no information for 2020 or 2021 available as of yet, uh, but- From publicly available sources. So yes. we, we were trying to be consistent, focusing on 2019 uh, for all of the jurisdictions. If uh, I think perhaps what we can do, Rohan, my sense is um, 
we, we cannot push the U.S. government to release the wrecks any faster than they're going to. They, unfortunately, operate at a snail's pace, and that has been my problem with the federal government for decades. Uh, we, we can't do anything there. However, on the gas prices, using other sources, maybe AGA, our contacts there, or maybe directly contacting the utilities, we might be able to do an update. So, uh, obviously, we don't have that information today, but if this is a priority, uh, we can address your second question. Uh, we cannot address the first one because the RECs uh, has to be published in order for us to use it. Okay, so if in 2019 we're paying 75 cents per 100 cubic feet, uh, what are we paying today? I know that there's been a price increase, and I'm hoping somebody from CPS can answer that. Hey, I'll, I, th I think you're asking what we're paying for MBTU. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but maybe, 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 Corey, the question is how much have gas prices changed just in percentage terms, regardless of the magnitude over the last, uh, you know, couple of years? Oh, um, I'm, I have to get back to you. I'm, off the top of my head, they've been pretty steady. It's, it's of late that we've seen uh, the prices go up to, you know, close to $6 per MBTU. Before that, they were hanging out at 250 you know, two or three fifty, somewhere between that range. Um, so I'll let let us do a circle back on it on that. I hear so, you. Uh, yeah, Corey, Corey, that that is what I was asking. Um, if mm -hmm. in twenty nineteen we were paying an average of seventy five cents, but uh, well, you said it's gone last year twenty twenty. It's it went up to over two dollars, and now. Well, so I don't know the seventy. I didn't catch the the seventy five cents reference. I was referencing what we're paying per per unit for MMBTU. So, and that's just the price of, you know, spot gas. Um, so what I'm saying is um, the, the average price was, you know, uh, in that 2 to $3 range for quite a bit. What you've seen lately unrelated to storm, right? Is just it tracking up their other various macro factors uh, influencing that. Um, so, but that was what I said, I'll, um, we'll get back to you uh, on from a percentage, but it's gone up, you know, um, it's gone up. From the that historical range of you know two to three dollars to now you know four or five dollars uh, per unit. Yeah, and and I I appreciate the fact that uh, you're you're talking real numbers versus percentage because sometimes that percentage, um, it, it they're sometimes I have a hard time imagining what it is today versus what it you know the, the comparison. Uh, yeah, somebody yeah. Tells me, somebody tells me that it's fifty percent, fifty percent of what? Fifty percent of, you know, uh, fifty cents or fifty percent of fifty dollars. I don't know. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate yeah. The, the 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 real number being used. No problem. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Over. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. sorry. This is. This is Amelia Batters with CPS Energy, and I've been looking up the information to to just give you a a general comparison of our gas costs that flows through to our, our customers. Um, and it has gone up, it has, uh, it has more than doubled, a little bit more than doubled since um, 2019. So if I just look at a particular month, September of 2019, uh, we were paying about $1.50 um, for gas. Um, and then September of 2021, we're paying about $4. And it is continuing to rise. So you, what you're seeing in the news is going to impact um, the energy bills for our customers. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Al, for uh, pointing out that uh, despair, discrepancy in the data. Um, that definitely impacts the not telling the kind of the full story of that burden. So we have Norman next and then Kurt. I don't see anybody else that has put their name in the chat. So um, if there's anybody else virtually drop your name in the chat or um, I will ask again after Kurt and then we'll turn it to the people that are actually in the room. So Norman. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I was curious, this goes way back to the early part of the presentation. Uh, we we hear continually about the large 
electrical electricity consumption for CPS energy customers in relation to other um, metropolitan areas. And one of the things I'm curious about, uh, just to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, are all of the bills that you're using for your comparison purposes, are all of those bills customers that have both electric and gas service? The reason I ask that question, and I don't know what the ratio is, but I know there's a a, a large number of customers in, in CPS Energy's uh, portfolio that are all electric. And I'm just want to make absolutely, you know, obviously an all electric home is going to consume more electricity than a electric gas combined energy home. I just want to make sure that all of the bills that you're using for these comparison purposes are both gas, all gas electric customers and not electric only customers? That's, that's a good question. And I wish I could uh, do what you're asking us to do, which is to tell the federal government to collect data differently than they currently collect it. And again, good luck with that, right? They're not listening to me. So what they have is a hotspot. Uh, in, so we're looking at those specific counties and metropolitan areas. In each of those areas, you will see some all electric homes. You will see some electric and gas homes. You will see areas that are summer peaking. You will see areas that are winter peaking. You will see larger houses and smaller houses. You will see apartments. They're all averaged in. We do not have the data available to us, unfortunately, to do what you're describing, which ideally I would like to do. And that will require a separate survey that we undertake with each utility. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's not what we have done. What we have done is said, okay, for, for Stockton, let's see how much they're spending on electricity. On average, for all the customers who are in Stockton, California, do the same thing for natural gas, add them up, and there's the composite bill. Now you did see the San Antonio's electricity share at 85%, versus uh, some other areas at 50% is uniquely electric. Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit of apples and oranges. Maybe it's a bit of apples and oranges and watermelons, but uh, that's, uh, you know, at a high level, that's what we have been able to do. Even that took a lot of effort. No, I, and I appreciate that. Like I said, I, I, I appreciate also understanding where your data was coming from. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and I don't, there's probably no way to determine this, whether CPS Energy has a higher percentage of all electric customers than other metropolitan areas. Yeah. We, we had some major home builders here in San Antonio for decades that were doing all electric housing. So we have tens of thousands, tens of thousands of homes that were built in the, I'd say, 80s, 90s, maybe early 2000s. Uh, that were all electric. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I did thousands of lots that were all electric that didn't have any gas service uh, during my career. I but see. Um, anyway, so I'm just I'm 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 just curious about that. I don't think it affects today's. I apologize for taking up this much time. I don't think it really affects today's issue of affordability. But I just wanted to make sure we were comparing as best we could apples to apples, and I see that you are. Uh, relying on the federal data, uh, and I guess secondly, I guess the uh, uh, philosophical question is: It also possible that our electric consumption is higher than the other communities because our rates are lower than the other communities? I think there's a you know my 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 freshman economics class would tell me that when the prices are down, demand goes up uh, for a, for a product. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's a little bit of cause and effect there, uh, which you don't have to answer, but that's just my a, a curiosity point. Thank you for my thank you for my time. I, I I will answer the second part of your question because being an economist, that thought has continued to echo in my mind as well. If you have lower prices, you will have more usage. If you have higher prices, you'll have lower usage. Other things equal, right? That's the challenge. Other things equal. I have to tell you. If, about a decade ago, I was doing a project in Saudi Arabia on energy efficiency. And as you know, back then, at least, they heavily subsidized the electricity prices. They were like one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. 
their consumption numbers were enormous for houses. And I wanted a point of reference within the US so I could do some comparisons. The only state that came close to Saudi Arabia in terms of usage per customer was the Lone Star State. <laughs> Does that surprise you? I mean, if you have lower prices, you're going to have higher usage. That is without a doubt a factor, but it is not the only factor, right? Climate is another factor. The amount of other states with lower prices have more efficient houses because they have codes and standards. Minimum efficiency levels are required. As, a, as somebody who was in that business, I'm sure you can relate to it, right? If there is a minimum efficiency standard, now some cities are passing ordinances that new homes will only be all electric homes, right? Counties are banning gas hookups. That will make a difference, but that revolution has just slowly begun to happen. And it's probably not going to be there in the 2019 data we had. However, we can probably do a quick check to see if San Antonio has a higher percentage of all electric homes than other urban areas in our sample. We, we might be able to get some quick uh, responses to that. Again, if that's a priority, we can, you know, hunt it down. Well, I, it, it shouldn't be a priority in, in today's conversation for sure. Is we're, that's not what we're talking about today. But th thank you so much for offering that. Just a point of curiosity in my mind. Sure. Uh, if we're comparing apples to apples, I'd like to understand what the ratios are. Thank you. Even within apples, as you know, there are so many different kinds. So we, we did our best to have apples to apples, but we have some green ones, some red ones, you know, all of that challenge is there. Thank you. You know, Norman, Thank if you, I could just Norman. add to that. Oh, go for it. Oh, sorry, Louise. Is that okay? Uh, so <clears throat> I, was, I was flipping through the other slides. I think to your, the first part of your question, Norman, you asked, I think it was the bill comparison, electric and gas. Um, I, I know separately we have, you know, we have it on our website and our fact card, but we do show the comparison of a combined electric and gas bill to other cities um, based on analysis that we do. So I don't, it, if I'm hearing your question right, there is a view we can share with you, I'll send you the link that shows how San Antonio, as an example, compares from a combined electric and gas bill uh, to say Houston or Dallas or Phoenix or Chicago, um, looking electric and gas combined. So if that's helpful, we'll share that too. Thank you, Corey. That would be great if you could share that. Um, we have a few other people still signed up, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to get through today. So uh, next is Kurt, uh, patiently waiting, then Femi, and then we have all three participants that are there in person uh, would also like to speak. So uh, Kurt, then Femi, and then we'll um, uh, move over to the actual room. Go for it, Kurt. Thanks very much. I, I just wanted to comment that most of what Wayne said has kind of been how I've been thinking about this ever since I joined the RAC. So in my mind, I thought, and I think we're getting there, but I listened to Corey's response. Um, you know, according to our management, CPS management, you know, what is the revenue that we need to sort of maintain status quo considering OPEX, CAPEX, all the things, you know, GNA, and then layer on top of that, if we if there are some improvements we need to make either because of reliability based on what happened last winter or the emergency uh, preparedness committee recommendations how much more do we need there and the technology upgrades and so forth what do they add and i assume those ads would be looked at in kind of a risk assessment like a probability and magnitude of risk a risk adjusted basis to help uh, make a decision uh, on those things um and then, of course, if you and assuming, you know, that the city is not going to pass a, an ordinance to lower their 14 percent take or voluntarily do that, you know, we're kind of on our own with this exercise within CPS of, of, of how to cover all this. Today's presentation, the big takeaway, it's obvious and most of us knew is that San Antonio is a relatively poor, large city. Uh, and so whether you think the energy burden numbers are better or worse than other places, this is a real issue for a lot of people uh, that has to fa be factored into this mi mix. But if we had those items, if you had sort of the revenue levels and you could figure out the puts and takes and what are we giving up, I think, as Wayne said at one point, uh, in, uh, you know, then you know, all the constituencies here can decide 
you know, okay, uh, well, I'll make this up. You know, we can forego the computer upgrade because we're a relatively poor, large city. We, re we need to do more on subsidization, weatherization, all the things that help low-income people. That's a higher priority for us than some of these other things. But to make those trade-offs and make those choices uh, really require, and, and whether it should be 10%, 5%, 1%, or 20%, uh, the percent tells me nothing at this point. I really need to look at it in the way I just said uh, for me to have some kind of reasonable judgment on that. So that's that's my comment for, for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Dr. Femi. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm still, I have been trying to work out my camera. It's for some reason in the last 10 minutes, it just started acting up on me. So I hope I'll, I'll be able to fix this before I have a next opportunity to speak. But I just have a quick comment and I'm going to piggyback on what Wayne said earlier. I mean, I take the term cut to the chase. I mean, what are we really talking about? I mean, let's trim the fat and get to what's, uh, what's important. And it, it's in the title of today's meeting. I mean, the theme is really the, the low income customers. Um, how exactly is that that burden is, 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 is really on the low income customers and no slide shows that better than number slide number 22, which was for the five quintiles. Um, uh, I guess it's of the five quintiles and also there's also a comparison with other cities. I mean, in Texas, as well as across the country. And it's very clear in that in those slides that the burden is really on the first uh, quintile. And so uh, when we, I remember the very first meeting that uh, I believe Dr. Faraki made the presentation about the care program. And I had asked the question, is it really a cross subsidization program? And I believe the answer was yes. So really when we look at those quintiles, first, second, third, and fourth, all except the first fall under the AC triple E 6% uh, threshold. So I look at cost allocation in this case, following um, CPS Energy's model as a zero sum game. You take from somewhere, something else has to be adjusted. So if we are going to cater for the low income folks and use affordability strictly as a basis, for this uh, rate case or whatever you want to call it, and not necessarily the cost of service, then it's going to fall on the second, third, and fourth, and fifth quintiles to cover whatever those discounts are going to be going to the first quintile. It is a zero sum game, game as I see it. And um, unless we do exactly what uh, Kurt said, you know, cut something, therefore reduce the revenue requirements. If we stick with the revenue requirements and we're trying to cater for the low income, then of course the higher income groups will be carrying the burden for those uh, discounts. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Femi. Um, uh, let me. Is there anybody else uh, on online? If not, I am going to turn it over to Brenda. We can start with those in the room, and then we'll make it back around. Hello, this is Andy Castillo. Hey, Andy, could you hold off? Let me get, let me get Brenda, Didi, and Peter, and then I will come back around to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see everyone's faces. Um, so let me start by saying that um, I too, Wayne, was quite surprised when I heard in the media that eight um, percent uh, information. Um, quite surprised because not. I felt like my charge here was not to help make reasonable reasonable recommendations at some point uh, to the city council, but also to keep my community informed. So, you know, we had been talking 10%, 10%, and then all of a sudden I hear in the media that it's eight. So I guess I have to, um, Rudy, I have to assume that you did say you, you all were having many conversations with, you know, city council or MUC. And I guess what I'm now a little concerned about is that if you are having not to, 
I'm not saying report, but you're, you're having to have conversations with them. And then you also then um, have to answer questions for us. I just wonder if perhaps we are asking the same questions and therefore CPS is we're having to work uh, a little harder to provide them information and then provide our group information. I mean, how is that, how is that working right now? Well, uh, <laughs> We are glad, you know, the rate advisory committee is a charge from our board uh, to, you know, to educate the community on our business and to get input into a lot of things that they've charged you with, um, you know, including, you know, um, input on, you know, on this particular uh, potential rate request. So um, I don't know. I think we're presenting information uh, to the RAC that that the RAC is interested in and has given us feedback on that we're hopeful is helpful in uh, coming to, you know, some perspective on uh, the rate request. You know, the, 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 the process with the city is very, um, you know, it, it's, it's very uh, procedural and, you know, we, we kind of have a, uh, you know, experience with the way the city likes to dig into our numbers. Um, you know, and they look at everything. They look at our, O and M projections for the next five years. They look at our capital projections for the next five years. They look at our load forecasts and all the elements that factor into what the rate ultimately is. And they say, yes, we, ag we agree with you or they challenge us on assumptions that they, maybe they think um, they need some more information on, you know, and it ultimately that process leads to alignment on, okay. Um, you know, we, we agree um, city and CPS energy that you know, 10%, 8%, 5%, 0% um, ultimately is the right number. Um, and so, you know, so it's important. It's, a, you know, that's their job as, as our regulator ultimately uh, to, you know, to, to, to either, you know, agree with kind of the assumptions we've made or, you know, or, or, or kind of fine tune the numbers. And we're in the middle of that process right now. Uh, again, we were uh, in our efforts to be proactive uh, we got out there and we started talking about this, knowing that it was kind of a working estimate. Um, but where we end up, uh, you know, it will be the result of a lot of hard work. But but here's what I know uh, to answer your question. I know that our board and council wants to know what the RAC thinks about this, and we don't want to come to you at the end of this process with a number that we've agreed, you know, that we've all agreed is it will help. Uh, allow us to do the job that the community expects of us. You know, we, we're trying to bring you along as we go. And I know that's a new, this is a new process for, for you. It's a new process for us, but I think it's valuable. I, I know our board and council expects us to do this work. Um, and, you know, and, and we're in this to do that. So, so I just want to reassure you. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I don't think I wouldn't call it kind of double work. I think it's work that, you know, is, is they're on, you know, dual trajectories because we want the rec to feel like you've been fully educated on the implications. That's all. I bring this up because I, I learned um, a little more than a month ago that apparently a similar energy burden um, report was presented by a local group to the city council. And once again, although Brattle does an excellent job, um, you know, I, I'm not going to try to dismiss that an excellent job. I just feel, I just feel like perhaps maybe if that report had been looked at uh, a little bit more seriously first, it wouldn't have required Brattle to work near as hard as they did. Um, I agree also to the comparisons for me um, are not insignificant, but my focus is what are we going to do for San Antonio? What are we going to do for our community? And so um, that may be a little selfish, but that's what I care about today. So I just thought I would share that. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, next is Dee Dee. I, I don't have anything right now, but I do want to say, like, Brenda brought up a good question in the the, the uh, gem report that I had uh, sent over um, as well as and and I'm assuming that um, there's also you know the the AC triple E report also that uh, studied energy burdens in San Antonio. So, um, but nothing else besides that. Thank you, Didi. 
Um, hey, can I can I make a comment, uh, Louisa, on on the last couple of uh, remarks? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we we were provided those reports. We have looked at those reports. Uh, they were very helpful to us. Uh, but I believe we have carried the analysis much further than those two reports had done. Thank you. Um, I definitely encourage all of you uh, to read those reports. I do believe that um, there is a lot of information and uh, especially information around the implications of uh, utility burden in those reports. So really do encourage that and they should be in your email. Peter, you are next. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, Dr. Faruqi, thank you for the um, the presentation. Uh, very good data, and I can I can see some areas that that could be useful for what's what I proposed at the last meeting. That that I think that uh, a large number of the the RAC, at least in in concept, and in support of the low income impact, in creating a study or an analysis and a study directly related to how the rate increase will impact the low income and and you today you equated that burden the energy burden component and so i wanted to ask you if you could share well i'll, I'll share this first i shared a a slide that you had presented back in a, in our july i believe it was you and it was our july 8th uh meeting where you referenced a, <clears throat> a case study in Sacramento, it was a Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and it raised fixed charges and introduced a time of use. And you referenced in that that they did a, it says, before filing the, the, the uh, time of use, they conducted a successful pilot in, in testing what, what, they, the, what the outcome would be. And then it shows the outcome that customers reduced the residential peak as far as the energy efficiency, and they saved three or two percent. So that's data that was available to be able to make an assessment. And then it says that ninety-six percent of the customers stayed on the TOU for the time of use. So my question is: Are there other studies like this directly related to the the effect on the low income and how we can? address their, their, the impact, and then use that data to make adjustments. So if we do introduce it, and, and I'll give you an example, we're looking at a fixed rate increase, 100% just on the fix, but it's, it could be a variable, could be a 50% fixed, 50% variable. And each one of those has a different impact on a low income user versus a low usage user. And, and so doing a study, what, what I'm proposing is, is trying to get the data that we can utilize to identify how the rate increase will directly impact that customer. And, and if, we can't, if we can't get it on the front end, the analysis can't be made, then on the back end, once it's done, because Reed asked this question when I presented it, he said, are you talking about doing an analysis on the front end before we do the rate increase? Or are you talking about doing something post rate increase, where now you're looking at what's the impact, and then you come back at maybe 12 months, and then you try to come back and help the low in, the, the low income customer. And I thought about it, I said the back end, but now we definitely have to do an analysis on the front end. So it would be helpful if you could, could help in providing some feedback on that, on what data do we need? And I've asked, and, I, and today you kind of shed more light on the data that I don't have or we don't have. Uh, the only data is the ADP, and I asked, what's the metric that you can use, that CPS can use to identify the low-income uh, customer? All I have is ADP, and then today, you shed light that there's the, 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 the REAP. I thought they were all combined into one, and, and then there was also the other, well, of course, STEP. And I just want to get a clarification on that from CPS, because I think it's very important if we're going to make a decision on how we conduct the study that we get the data that would be applicable, and then look at how it can be applied to the study. But that would be an analysis first, then going into a study post uh, rate increase. So I hope that makes sense, and if you can give some feedback on any examples you can give related to that that would help our work here on the ground to try to produce something like that. Okay, well that was actually a very, very important question. Actually it has several questions embodied in it. If uh, 
you will allow me, I'd like to split it into three separate questions. So the first question is, what is the impact of an increase in the rate level for low income customers? Uh, second question is, what if I also change the rate structure by raising the fixed charge? And third, what happens if I introduce a time of use rate? So there are three moving parts here. One is the rate level. Second is the fixed charge as a share of the total charge. And the third is whether you want to change the rate structure from a flat rate to a, or an inclining block rate to a time of use rate. I will address those uh, individually, but before I do that, you also made another point, which I thought was a very important point, that should the study be done before or after the rate increase has taken effect. Implicit in your question was a reference, and actually explicitly mentioned it to the smart work, the Sacramento Municipal Utilities District. They actually did a pilot. And so let me try to address those uh, in sequence. And if I forget one of those, please remind me because I'm doing this in real time, right? And not writing anything down. So the increase in the average, let's assume there's a, for, for discussion purposes, it's a 10% rate increase. And let's assume every customer now faces a price that is 10% higher, whether they are low income or high income or medium income, they're all seeing a 10% higher price. Well, uh, what would be the impact on their energy burden? So if nothing else changes, their energy burden will be 10% higher because it's P times Q over income. Income didn't change, Q didn't change, price went up 10%, so the numerator went up 10%. The denominator didn't change, so the energy burden will uniformly rise by 10%. If it's just a simple proportional rate increase. Again, this is on the top of my head, it, we can check the math. So the question then is, I think one of the previous commentators brought up the notion of price elasticity which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. You raise the price, you lower the usage. And so when you raise price by 10%, you're probably going to lower usage based on the studies I've seen by about 1%. So the energy burden will probably go up by 9% if you raise the price by 10%, because the quantity will come down by 1% or something like that. Um, so that, that's uh, going to have the same effect whether you're low income or high income. Second question was fixed charges, raising fixed charges, like SMART did. I think their number was $7, now it's $20 over a several year period, they, they raised the number. Omaha Public Power District also raised their fixed charge over several years. They tripled it, they lowered the energy price. So when you raise the fixed charge, it has a bigger impact on the bills of the smaller users because the fixed charge is a bigger chunk of their bill because they don't consume much volumetrically, so their energy portion is lower. So the question is, are low income customers also smaller users? And a lot of research has been done on that and there is no clear answer because a lot of the low income customers live in poorly insulated dwellings with less efficient appliances. And sometimes they have larger families or more occupants in the home. So they might actually be larger users. So it's hard to know without looking at the data for San Antonio's customers and seeing are the low income customers going to see a higher impact of a fixed charge increase than the larger volume customers. But that analysis certainly can be done before the rate increase goes into effect because the data already is there on customer usage histories. Small, large, you correlate it with income status and you quickly run it through. Third was the time of use rate transition. So those people who have a lot of air conditioning will see a higher bill. Those that don't have a lot of air conditioning will see a lower bill with a time of use rate. And then the question is, what about low income customers? So on that, we have new data from Maryland, the state of Maryland. Three pilots were done over the last two years in the state of Maryland by three of the investor owned utilities as part of a program called PC44, which the Maryland Commission has as one of his programs. Uh, we were asked to analyze the data 
from the thousands of customers who are in those three pilots. And what was unique and different about those pilots was that the low income customers were in a separate track, so to speak, than the non low income customers. And it was done, the two track approach, because Maryland, as you know, Baltimore has uh, a lot of low income customers. And as you will recall from my slides, they are one of the 11 cities we looked at. The Baltimore Gas and Electric, Pepco, and Del Mar were power and light with the three utilities. Each one of them had a separate track for low income from non low income. And the big question was, are low income customers going to benefit from these rates or are they going to be harmed by these rates? And how do the results compare with the non low income customers? And the analysis is finished. Uh, we have presented the results uh, last week to the working group and I can send you a summary later on. But the gist of it is that low income customers behaved very similarly to non low income customers. They both benefited from the provision of a lower off peak price. They both had an incentive to reduce their peak usage and thereby lower their bill by avoiding the high peak price. So long and short is results are very encouraging from Maryland, results are very encouraging from SMUD. Um, other pilots have been done, like for example, by Oklahoma Gas and Electric uh, with dynamic pricing rates. Uh, and they have found that customers, once properly educated and informed, find those rates to be very advantageous. It's not like they have to shut down their life during the peak period. It's just that they have to make some adjustments to the thermostat setting by one or two degrees in the peak period. And by raising, the, uh, they, they can lower the thermostat in the summer and the off peak period by two degrees. They call it pre-cooling. I'm sure you're familiar with that term. And now companies like Google and others are coming in with smart thermostats that you program and you don't have to think about it. And some of them are even offering free thermostat installation. So there are lots of opportunities with time of use rates and smart thermostats to help lower customer bills while also lowering the utility costs of serving those customers. And again, each area is unique and different. I understand, and I could be wrong on this, uh, that time of use rates have not been fully tested in the Texas climate uh, in general and in San Antonio in particular. Uh, there might be an opportunity to do some pilots with time of use rates and also pilots with other kinds of rate innovations. Uh, do a pilot takes time, right? You can't do it overnight, but you can certainly do the bill analysis before the pilot to see if I was to introduce new rate option A, B, or C, what would be the impact on customer bills? And then you can segregate the analysis by income classification. So I don't know if uh, my rambling made any sense uh, uh, or whether it addressed your question or not, but I'm happy to, uh, to, to do a follow-up if needed. Yes, thank you. In some, some areas it did, and, and I thank you for the, the presentation uh, analysis where you provided some options, because I think that was an important part of what could be done on the subsidy side. So in one of your presentations, uh, which was a rate design principles, allocating costs among customers, allocation costs, uh, you said that no customer should unintentionally subsidize another customer, often referenced as cross subsidization. And obviously that's that's what's what I believe happens currently and the this what you shared about sh shifting the potentially having the option to shift the 70 million dollars that is the total step and if 2020 is going toward the, the low income as part of the subsidy equation i think that's something very important to look at and then who subsidizes and what other forms of subsidy are available so we can take the burden off of that the, the larger group as much as we can, so it isn't taking on so much of the load of the subsidization. I think that should be part of the study as well, because I, I recommended two different studies, one for the low income and one for the, the step solar and how that benefit has really taken, of course, energy efficiency is a benefit. There's that benefit there. But if we're reevaluating that program, I think it's important that it be studied as well. So those are my last thoughts. I didn't have a question on that. I just want to thank you for the information.
Thank you very much. I, I will make one comment on the, the STEP solar program in particular. Uh, your program is unique. Uh, probably Energy Austin uh, or Austin Energy is the only other utility that actually offers an incentive for customers to install solar. Um, and I, I did a survey um, a few years ago for the Texas Clean Energy Coalition. I talked to uh, several utilities within Texas, including, of course, CPS Energy and Austin and the others. And, and I am familiar with programs around the country. So your program... Uh, may have matured and you may not need to provide a solar customer incentive. They, they already have the net metering incentive, I believe. So you are going over and above that and providing this incentive. And at least in other states and other jurisdictions, the argument has been presented that solar customers are more affluent than the non-solar customers. So the subsidy that is occurring is a regressive subsidy. And perhaps uh, in, a, in an environment you're going to see a rate increase uh, for all customers. You want to specially protect and guard uh, your low income customers. So if you wanted to change that allocation of money, uh, again, I'm just speaking at large as an economist and I'm not privy to the details uh, of uh, CPS Energy step programs and what approval processes that goes through. And hopefully I'm not uh, stepping beyond my line here, but I would definitely take that away and I would focus more of the money on the low income segments. Now there are community solar programs and there are programs specifically that involve solar energy for low income communities, right? And so you may want to change the, the nature of your solar portfolio to focus more on the low income community segment. Everybody can benefit from solar. The sun rises every morning for all of us. The question is who can afford to tap the sun's energy and convert that into power for their own house. I think the low income customers will benefit as much from that as the high income customers. But the question is how best to harness the power of the sun to benefit not just the affluent customers that are probably doing it today, but also the low income segment and maybe primarily the low income segment. I, I could go on and on, but I have to stop. Thank you. Thank you. We um, have uh, Andy next, and then I will go after that. I don't see any of the, any additional people in the queue. So, Andy, go for it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andy Castillo. Um, mainly in the south and west area of town. Uh, you know, a lot of these homes. I just want to emphasize a lot of these homes. You know, were built some of them over a hundred years ago, and were designed to breathe. And so. You know, throughout the years, uh, energy codes have changed, and a lot of the new homes that are built, you know, are built are designed to uh, keep in that energy compared to the the ones downtown and south and west. So, I just want to emphasize, you know, that a priority should be given to these older homes um, that have, you know, generations of families that live in them, um, like uh, was told today. Uh, I also wanted to just uh, just give one more comment that uh, even today I had someone, uh, an elderly person that had um, a uh, smart thermostat already installed and was using it, but it seemed to always have trouble. She had asked me, you know, what I thought about it. I, I told her, you know, these things will help your energy efficiency. And, you know, if you're, if you're not home or if you forget to turn it off, you can get out get on your phone and, and, and turn off your AC if you're not going to be home and, you know, her, her comment was, you know, I just want something simple because I can't understand it. So uh, another thing to just emphasize on is, um, yes, there's technology that will help these, you know, a lot of people, um, rich or poor, but, you know, if, if the technology is not understood, uh, you know, it, it won't benefit, you know, either, either group of people. So uh, I just wanted to bring that out as well uh, since I had that, that talk today. Uh, with somebody. Thank you. I, I, I agree completely with you on the smart thermostat aspect that you just brought up. In the Maryland pilots, what we discovered was exactly what you're describing, that people were not really programming the thermostats to reflect the fact that the time of use rate only applied during five days, the work days, and did not apply 
on the weekend days. All the weekend hours were off peak, but somehow they didn't know how to program their thermostats. Maybe some of them didn't even have programmable thermostats. So what they were doing was even during the weekends, they were reducing peak load and raising off peak load, when in fact all 24 hours were off peak. I was stunned. I was tiny. And then I thought, there's an educational challenge here. It's not very difficult, by the way, to program the thermostat, but it's still for somebody who is not used to interacting with the technology. You could do it on your smartphone, but what if they don't have the app? They need to have the app. How do they download the app? I mean, it's almost like you have to assume that they don't know how to program the app. You have to help them and guide them. And only then does it become possible. And the last comment I'll make is you mentioned um, that this was an elderly person. Well, I'm in that category now. I think I can safely say that. And I know how to do it, but of course I'm in this field. I have a PhD in economics. I have a nephew, very smart, much younger than me. He's working for a very high tech company called Logitech, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. He has a Nest thermostat, the very latest. He has solar panels. He's on a time of use rate. He has an electric car. So when I went to him to check it all out the a month ago, I said to him, have you programmed your Nest thermostat so that it doesn't give you maximum comfort when the power is more expensive? In other words, have you programmed it for your time of use rate? He just looked at me and he said, uncle, I just turn it off. I only use the air conditioner when I have to. I said, but you can program that into your thermostat. He didn't even think of that. But this is a guy in the tech industry. So it is a huge challenge. I think it is only huge because, because we are not used to talking to customers and explaining technology to them. I mean, I was stunned and really surprised that in California this was happening. It's a universal challenge. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I just want you to know that it's not just the elderly who have this issue. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's true. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will bring us back to the topic of today. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to stick to some of these high level just because we're running out of time. And I, I want to start with a couple of things. Um, the one of the very first things that I really want to acknowledge about this uh, metric and you highlighted it in slide three was really the con uh, um, that it's really an underrepresentation of the severity and the suffering that low income folks um, are dealing with when it comes to utility burden. It is they are having to um, live in unhealthy condition conditions, including life threatening conditions in many cases, right, during during uh, some of the hottest months in San Antonio. And there's a lot of data to really back that up nationally that that is con really connected to uh, even health impacts. Um, the other thing I really, I had asked CPS, and I don't know if that made its way to, towards you, but I had specifically asked how many customers do we have experiencing uh, energy burden and how many customers do we have experiencing severe energy burden, right? Those two things and that difference. And I didn't see that in this report, but I did see that in a report that Didi had sent out and I read, which talked about 120,000 people uh, are experiencing energy burden and uh, almost 30,000 people are experiencing severe energy burden. And so I uh, really want to put that in, in numbers because we ha currently have 113,000 customers that are past due and 77,000 customers that are facing disconnections. So I have said this statement before, but you cannot squeeze blood out of a rock. And so how are, and if we are uh, taking those losses and writing them off, as we had mentioned in one of the other calls, and then tying it back in into uh, the rate increase, we're really kind of perpetuating that issue. And so really wanting to identify that. Um, and then also really thinking, and I want us to consider that th this metric is not used alone. The As you had mentioned in, I can't remember what slide four, 
where you're talking about all the different considerations um, that are that go into the utility burden. What we need to also acknowledge is that legally, you know, uh, a lot of people that are energy burden are um, obviously low income, and they are a lot of renters. Um, we are looking at of a quarter million rental units in San Antonio. Um, there is a direct link to those that are being disconnected, to those that will ultimately have a threat of eviction, right? There is a responsibility of those that are renting to be able to upkeep the utilities. And if they are disconnected, uh, um, ele electrical um, insecurity or energy insecurity is directly linked to housing insecurity and also directly linked to health. And so I really want to mention that. And then although we did see a kind of an average of uh, the the trending downward, that energy burden is trending downward, uh, the report that specifically was shared uh, by Didi it actually conflicts that. It says that it's been it's been the same. And although uh, you have seen improvements across the nation on energy burden here in San Antonio, it's been the state the same. And so we are have really been kind of perpetuating that over. Over the last decade, um, the other uh, thing I wanted to point out is on slide 10, we uh, a note that we are using 22% more electricity than the national average. And, and so I, um, I really want to bring that up because our residential rates, what has been shared with us has been kind of like the primary residential rate, but we really haven't talked about the details of those large capacity users. And as a matter of fact, we didn't even see a bill of those large capacity residential users on the last call. Um, and so what is, you know, uh, I really want to know about those highest users. In fact, my last, uh, uh, the question I had on last week's call was how many of those highest users? I want to know how many people do we have customers do we have in those highest users? I want to know the rate, the fixed rates that they are paying uh, since those were not shared with us. And I really want to see how that overlaps with low income because one of the other statements that you said was um, about uh, on slide 24 where you were referencing um, the low income or the first quartile paying an, an average yearly about $1,300 and the fifth uh, quintile paying more of $2,300 over the course of the year. So that says that that kind of narrative contradicts that low income households are using more energy. So I think it's important that we dive deeper into that because uh, there is seems to be this kind of villainization of people that are poor and um, and that's not necessarily true. Um, I want to highlight that low income people look at the demographics. You can research the demographics on Google. Low income people in San Antonio make up children, senior citizens, disabled communities, um, and single parents. And so we, we need to realize that what low income looks like and, and not villainize those individuals um, and, and or the inability to pay um, as well. And so I also want to reference that I had asked about uh, Sacramento or other cities that are have you municipal utilities being uh, I want to see some energy burden rates for cities that have municipal utilities specifically. I'm so glad um, that the Sacramento uh, example was was shared. That study was shared. So I appreciate that, Peter. I was hoping that we were going to see Sacramento's energy burden rate because in 2016 it was pretty high. So I'd like to see how those kinds of initiatives actually may have reduced their rate. I'd like to for us to consider that as a case study and actually look at other municipalities and what they have done to actually reduce the energy rate. Um, I also want to reference that we keep making the comment that we're a poor city. Well, we are a poor city and we're going to continue to be a poor city if we keep giving out cheap energy for trashy jobs that are not paying living wages. And so we give a lot of incentives out to a lot of different uh, uh, businesses and industries, and then we're not getting the actual uh, raising the bar or the uh, uh, standard of living for our residents. So it is both not a utility issue, it is also a city of uh, San Antonio issue. And so we really need to acknowledge that. Um, and so 
I'm also going to say that uh, I agree with Didi's comment about the 9.7% of the community uh, dealing with um, burden. Uh, when we compare that to other cities like Dallas and Houston, more specifically, we're talking about private utilities that their aim is for uh, profits to their stakeholders. So it's very important that we're really comparing municipal utilities, public utilities that ultimately do have a different responsibility to those communities. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was the map. I want us all to look at those maps very carefully. I also want us to look at the maps the city of San Antonio has on their website in their equity atlas. Those maps where we saw the east, west, and south side um, having the most energy burden, what we also need to highlight is that uh, in those in those zip codes or those areas, we are also talking about uh, the lowest life expectancy. We're talking about eviction rates being the highest. We're talking about the lowest education. Uh, we're talking about uh, layers and layers of impacts for those communities. And so this is why it's so important that we look at how this utility, how our rates actually impact those communities. And I'm not talking just about the cost of uh, the fuels, right? The cost of the energy, but we are talking about increasing fixed cost during this pro this proposal, and so it's really important to understand even how those fixed costs are either benefiting those communities that they would be adding those on. Um, I also want to reiterate that the step program is not a discount program. Um, it is a reimbursement program, and that is very different. And so when I really I, I kind of took offense to that because that is not a discount program. Um, and it's not only that, it has to be initiated by those low income customers, which I know we're going to talk about in those other presentations um, as well. And so the one other piece I want to mention is that I know we have gaps in the data and fuel costs. Uh, I think that's very um, uh, uh, was called out today, but it also has been called out by uh, the Department of Energy looking at higher fuel costs, even as we're facing in the next next couple of years. Um, this all this does not change the fact that the city is also raising the standard for the building. So newer buildings are more efficient, right? And so we there is less effort that we need to make in getting those new buildings to be efficient. We have a lot of older stock and a lot of low income homes. And so being able to identify where the, we have the biggest problem and then uh, leaning in to understand that problem and address it is very important. And ultimately that's why we have this, uh, this topic today. So, I um, I think I'll leave it there and I apologize for being uh, uh, pretty rushed. I feel like I have way too many comments and we don't have the amount of time. Dr. Farquhar, I don't know if you wanted to respond to any of that or if- yeah, I, 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 I certainly uh, would want to respond. I've taken some notes. Uh, those are all good points, first of all. I mean, obviously this is a topic that requires a serious rethinking of the situation. Let me respond to some specific points you have made and then you know, CPS Energy folks on the call might want to make additional comments, and I know uh, uh, Dr. Femi has some comments as well. But in the interest of time, um, let me just say this. Um, you said we did not provide the number of customers who have those very high energy burdens, either severe or, or even worse than severe. What we did was we provided the information by income quintile. And so the first income quintile is 20% of the customers that have on average a burden of 9.7%. That's, that's almost 10% it's severe. And we could easily take the total number of customers that CPS Energy has, multiply that by 20%. In other words, a fifth of the customers and their number is 9.7%. And then we can look at the chart that I shared on those census tracks and some of them had burdens as high as 27%. So we could easily tell you how many customers are in, the, in those categories. So it's just a, some simple math that we need to do. I can't do it right now, but I can easily pull that together. So I think that was one of your issues. 
Thank you. That would be great to, to be able to see because we want to be able to understand the size of the problem as well, right? Absolutely. The numerical numbers matter. And jumping to your last question, I'll address the in-between ones in a moment. But your last question was about the geographical aspect of life. Uh, you mentioned uh, the West and East and the Southern areas. And what we have done is we have identified the energy burden by those areas. But what we have not done, and we'd be happy to do working with CPS Energy, they know where the money they're spending, whether it's on STEP or on REAP or ADP is being spent. So we could create another geographical chart that shows, okay, here is the geography of the energy burden by track, and here are the steps being taken to reduce the burden by geography. And you can then, you'll be able to see, is, is there a good overlap? Or do we need to refocus and retarget the the program? Now on step, I agree with you. It is not a discount program in the sense of the ADP or REAP, but it is a program that if the customer participates in it, they can lower the quantity consumed, and when they reduce the quantity consumed, they lower their energy burden. So it, it is it is a policy instrument. Yes, they do have to initiate the application process for step, and they may have to make some investment. So maybe it needs to be rethought so it's more focused on the low income customers demographics and also their education level, perhaps their lack of awareness uh, so that we can perhaps half of the money goes to the low income segment as opposed to two seventh of the money. Yeah, that was one of the things I mentioned earlier. Okay, one other item you mentioned was um, comparing San Antonio with other municipalities like Sacramento, for example. I would say we can add a few municipal utilities to the charts we showed. As you know, we had Los Angeles, but Los Angeles is quite different from San Antonio, as we all know. Uh, we had Jacksonville, which apparently is quite similar in the demographics, but we can add some other municipalities as well, like Fort Collins and Colorado, like Colorado Springs, okay? like uh, Omaha from Nebraska. Those are all municipal utilities and, and others that you may have in mind as comparable. And then we could look and see what are they doing to mitigate the energy burden for the very low income segments. So, so that, that I think was one of your suggestions. We can certainly act upon it. Um, I think um, you also had a very good point about who are the highest users, the ones who are putting the most demand on capacity. Um, what, what are their characteristics? And are they paying their fair share of the cost or not? So that's also something that could be, you know, looked into. Um, finally, I believe a point you made was that there are certain things that the city of San Antonio has to do, not just the utility. And that is so true. And I, I've been mentioning that more and more to utilities that you can also reach out to the legislature and the appropriate governmental bodies they can provide help through tax code changes, through grants, through uh, enhancing the LIHEAP program. Uh, it's as much because what you mentioned, which sometimes people forget, for those segments that are the disadvantaged segments of society, it, it's sort of like a living at the margin kind of an issue. Energy is just one piece of the puzzle. They have rents to pay. They have food to put on the table. I mean, they have all kinds of things that Charles Dickens used to write about, right? I mean, it is really a social issue and not just an electric utility issue or a gas utility issue. So the city of San Antonio clearly has to be engaged with this to make a major difference. So that, that, that's my very quick response. Happy to dive deeper into any of these, uh, you know, uh, perhaps later on. Uh, thank you. I I, I, um, I realized the time, but I just wanted to follow up with that. Um, in San Antonio, we have a 12 and a half illiteracy rate. That means one in eight San Antonian adults has trouble reading. Um, we have uh, a third of our population is Spanish speaking only. And we also have almost 400,000 or 20% of our community has uh, broadband or lack of internet access. So 
really also need to consider all those other barriers that prevent them from actually even taking advantage of different programs or connecting with CPS as well. And that doesn't even uh, cover the, the angst or the anxiety of contacting CPS and being afraid of being reported, evicted, uh, you know, uh, feeling like they might be disconnected or bring attention to themselves. So um, I appreciate that. And um, we literally, I, I've never had a, uh, meeting cover utility burden in three hours. I, this is something that has uh, been done over days. Um, and so I, I really feel like we are just scratching the surface here. We really want to dive in deeper to how that relates to our, what we are, our task is more specifically. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Femi and then we will get back to our presentation. Can, can I make just one quick comment? Uh, if Dr. Femi is okay with that. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Femi. In San Francisco, there are certain areas that are low income areas. And when California was doing its pilots with new rate designs, that issue came up that you just mentioned. They are afraid of somehow being reported. They don't have the education or the literacy to grasp what's happening. And so a separate track was done on that pilot specifically for that community. And it was track B. And it, we used different ways to engage with them. We had community outreach meetings. We had informal, casual lunches and dinners to bring the community together, church meetings to get this out. So they felt that it was a normal thing that was happening as opposed to something that they would feel threatened with or become suspicious about. You know, you have to reach out to them. You have to have their people spread the word. By their people, I mean people living in those areas. Who, who, for whom Spanish is the only language, right? Or maybe who are not literate. Most of these people I have discovered have relatives who are educated, younger people typically, and they can help educate their parents or sometimes their grandparents. So it requires word of mouth. It requires out of the box thinking on how to do an outreach when they don't have the internet, when they don't have broadband, when they don't even know what is a smart versus a dumb thermostat. So. Uh, innovative marketing is needed, and that's a separate topic altogether from today. But th the good news is we have a lot of ideas from other areas that are worth at least talking about in a future meeting. Thank you. Appreciate that. Dr. Femi? Yes, and uh, while that thought is still fresh in our minds, uh, what Dr. Faraki said, I'm going to reorder my four comments on a very quick. Um, Clearly, CPS Energy has a lot of work to do in public outreach along those lines. I mean, there are many ways to reach out to the community, and I think CPS Energy is doing its best, but we there's always room for more. I mean, and I think what you said is a very good way to approach this. We tend to listen to people that look and feel and think like us as, uh, many times, and as much as we can leverage those types of uh, avenues, it, it, it goes a long way. Um, I, I brought that up quickly because you, there was a discussion about pilots programs, and part of this is, of course, using the pilots to also sort of do, do research, sense what the communities, how they're responding to some of these trial methods. And I, my question was, I want to understand whether, given all the challenges in San Antonio, you know, the literacy level, the, all the various challenges we face, I always ask myself, do we have an appetite for those types of pilot programs, especially when they lead to some type of behavior modification? I mean, that is something not to be discussed, but it's an important, you know, social question that will always uh, remain with us, you know, as we go through this this effort. And I, I think I think we we're getting those perspectives from you, Dr. Faruqi, and it's very very um, helpful. So I'll go back to my number one, which was again. Looking at Eloisa's. Sorry, Dr. Femi, before you go, because I'll forget, can I respond to that just quickly? Please. So, recently in the state of Washington, working with one of the utilities, we suggested that before they do a pilot, they do an outreach to customers through focus groups. And because of the pandemic, the focus groups had to be done virtually. However, we learned a lot on how low income customers relate to energy versus how higher income customers relate to energy. So I would say before even designing a pilot or thinking of doing a pilot, it's best to just do an outreach and gathering 
of people either virtually or in person at some time through a focus group is extremely revealing. And you will find that people who have electric cars are thinking about electricity totally differently from those who are having a hard time making ends meet. So I, I would suggest before pilot focus groups would help provide insights. That's all I wanted to say on that point. Um, great. And, and I think that that's, that's even for that buttress is the point that, you know, there are many um, events that CPS Energy holds from time to time. You know, focus groups can be one of those as well and other other similar avenues. Um, I'm going to go to Eloisa's El El former life as uh, when she works with the Office of Sustainability. I could not help but notice that you mentioned those maps and my mind went to those social vulnerability index maps you presented, you know, many years ago. Um, you're essentially speaking to those types of, uh, of issues and you could almost lay those maps over some of the maps we saw today and they would so almost be a, I mean, they, they were green maps, but the greens will not match very well with the colors we had for today, even in shade and intensity and just distribution. So that, that was a very good observation. Uh, the other observation I made in Eloisa's comments was about the burden itself. In the first thing that caught my attention as somebody who do, does numbers uh, was the formula. I mean, it's a numerator, there are two numbers, a numerator and a denominator. You could reduce the burden either by reducing the numerator or increasing the denominator. As Dr. Faruqi said, Austin has a higher income level. Now, the question is, if we're talking about CPS energy, what is on CPS energy to address in that formula? It's the numerator. But what is, or who can address the denominator? It's going to be the bigger community, the city. It's up to our governance in the city. And that is not something that can be addressed in a shorter time frame. So we can look at the burden and say, in a very short time frame, we might see the, the denominator remain static for a while, while we can adjust the numerator. But over time, the burden of dealing with the burden falls a lot on our city, our economic you know, makeup, and all the things we're doing to essentially raise that level of household income to a point where hopefully we'll contribute towards reducing the burden. And so that, that was something I, I also picked up just mathematically, but also in the context of Eloisa's comments. My very last comment is really with the STEP program. And I'm wondering, this is where I need help because I, I again, this occurred to me as Eloisa was discussing the fact that the STEP is really not a discount, it is a reimbursement. And the question is, is there an, in my mind, is, is there an inbuilt assumption that not many people will participate in this program because we all are paying a little more into this pot that's funding the rebates and all the things that that support the step program but not all of us are actually utilizing those rebates and utilizing those energy efficiency measures is there an inbuilt assumption that there is a there's a sizable number that are paying into the program but not necessarily taking advantage of it which leads me to that question of if more people participate could the step program be bankrupt? Because then a lot of people are demanding this demand, this 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 this, um, this rebates and all that are not being funded by the additional costs that we're paying in our bills. I mean, it's just a question, just a thought. Might need some modeling or some numbers. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to talk about this some more, but it's, it's just a thought because I know that um, not everybody is participating in going to use this energy efficient, you know, installations and all that appliances, et cetera. But we are paying for it with an extra amount on, on, our, on our monthly bills. So just a thought, but I'm wondering if, you know, that implicit assumption is not there. Yeah, so, Doc, Dr. Femi, can I, can I address that real quick? Yes, please. Um, mm -hmm. On the STEP program, you know, again, we've talked about STEP before. You know, we've, we kind of put STEP together, you know, back before any of us were here. Um, you know, really to try to get something in there for for everyone. Um, you know, on the to it can be refocused to help those that mo are most in need, um, because that's not a kind of pay to play uh, program. Weatherization, you know, we we weatherize homes to you know about forty five hundred dollars per home, and we you know that it's 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 revenue limited, so we do. 3,600 homes, $4,500 a home, give or take. And whatever that number is, that's our budget, you know, for the year. And, you know, one of the things that we've, uh, that we're looking at right now is, you know, can we, you know, create a package of energy efficiency programs as the board 
deliberates on the future of step and whether or not there's going to be a step or not. Um, you know, can we uh, refocus it on helping those most vulnerable, you know, to kind of address these issues we're talking about today. So, um, so, so not everything requires an investment on the, the homeowners behalf if their income qualified, you know, th those are direct, those are direct payments for the work, uh, you know, uh, to the vendor that, that, you know, that make up our weatherization uh, approach. So I just kind of wanted to give you some perspective that, you know, that we have a different energy efficiency, you know, program that provide reads based on investment that the customer's making um, that, that we also uh, incent. So there's a couple of different ways that we do it. Yeah, th th thanks for, for, for clarifying that, uh, Rudy. I really appreciate that. Um, and of course, it's, it just goes to show that even though initially, uh, in terms of how we're approaching the RAC activities, we had put step in under a certain bucket that wasn't exactly directly the focus of the rate increase, which is a more short term uh, measure. But this just shows that there are overlaps in those initial three, group, three groups that we had. And step is one of those that I felt was always on the borderline between what usually what was previously groups one and two, working groups one and two. So I'm glad you know we're not exactly throwing step into a different bucket, but it is part of what we're trying to work towards on that current um, uh, rate increase uh, request and all that. So thanks again, appreciate. It. Thank you so much, Dr. Femi, Dr. Perkwai. Um, I just also want to want to reference that in the STEP program, there's only the only uh, program that is um, geared towards low income is that is the um, weatherization program. So I just want to just say that in general, there's only one program through STEP to support low income. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are 20 minutes away and I'm going to lean over to the CPS folks because we have two present or two uh, short presentations and so I want to uh, see how do you want to approach that. We are going to be talking about the customer assistance programs. I think that might be a, a good next step in tying into what has been shared thus far. Uh, yes, ma'am. We're still prepared to give that presentation, and I think we can do it in about 20 minutes. KJ's nodding her head. Yes, she can do it in about 20 minutes. I think we're good on that. Okay. We won't have a lot of time to discuss uh, if within those 20 minutes. If we can, if we can get through that pretty quickly and just allow for a few minutes, that would be great as well. Thank you so much, KJ. It's it's yours. All right, thank you. Um, also, I know we won't have a lot of time to discuss, but if there are questions that people want to ask offline, I can make always make myself available. So happy to do that as well. If we could bring up the presentation, Adrian. And while he's bringing it up, I just want to say thank you so much for letting me um, come and talk to you today about our community programs. Having these programs available to offer our customers means so much to our organization. My team, which is under Jesse Hernandez, um, is the boots on the ground team for the company. We connect to our community in person. We hear directly from our customers about all the difficulties that they face. And being able to say to them, hey, I can help you, it means a lot to each and every person on my team. So we could go to slide two. Thank you. Um, this is just a snapshot of the various assistance or programs that are available for our customers. If you want to learn about them, there's a website there. Um, you can go and spend lots of time reading about the various programs. But I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard us say this, and if you haven't, let me say it right now. If you know someone or you yourself are experiencing a financial hardship, please call our customer service team. We want to be able to help every single customer, set them up on a payment plan, and then also connect them with all the various assistance that's available to our community right now. We work with our customers in a holistic approach, so we don't just say, hey, let me help you pay your bill. We talk to our customers and say, hey, do you need food? Let me connect you to the food bank. Do you need diapers? Let me connect you to the diaper bank. Do you need legal assistance? Let me connect you to legal aid. We, we try to do everything that we can to help our customers from a more case management approach. So if you'll look on slide three, this is just a snapshot of the customers that are participating in our various programs. I know a lot of people are interested in the numbers um, of people that are participating. 
So I wanna point out while we're here that a customer can absolutely participate in our affordable discount program in our STEP program and can apply for REIT. They can do all of them. Um, they, we do not limit that. So if we can go on to slide four, um, I mentioned earlier, in addition to our programs, we work with numerous support agencies that are located throughout the community. These partnerships and our outreach, including our core calls, have actually helped us to connect our customers with now $40 million in assistance since June of 2020. And we take that very seriously. Um, not just our team, but our energy advisors now are also helping connect our customers to those assistance programs. And um, you can see the results of those efforts. On slide five, our affordability discount program does offer our customers a $12, up to a $12.30 discount on their energy bill. Um, these customers must be at or below 125% of the poverty guidelines to receive that discount. So you can see that chart there, I won't read it for you. But I know some of you are interested in the costs of the program. So we've outlined, outlined those costs on, on the chart here and on several of our other programs. If you go to slide six, um, you can see how many customers were enrolled in this program by council district, if you're interested in that information. Uh, and then on the very far side is the other category, and that's just people in our service territory who don't live within a city council district. On slide seven, um, we'll talk a little bit about REAP. This is a partnership between us and the city of San Antonio and Bear County to provide utility assistance to income qualifying customers. These customers who live in San Antonio and in Bear County can apply for up to $400 a year in assistance. And um, the qualifications will be on the next slide, but they also have to be below the federal poverty, 125% uh, of the federal poverty guidelines and experiencing a financial hardship. Uh, they must also either be elderly, handicapped, have small children in their home, or require critical care equipment. So as part of this partnership, CPS Energy actually contributes up to a million dollars a year to the REIT program. And then we also do additional fundraising. You can see on the chart at the bottom here how many customers um, have actually applied for a REIT over the years. And you'll see before the pandemic, the numbers were increasing every single year because the need was out there. Right now we have a lot of federal dollars in our community and so the city and the county are really focusing on using those federal dollars, which means they're not focusing as much on using the REIT dollars. So that's why the REIT numbers look a little low, but once those federal dollars are gone, we anticipate the need for REIT to go up higher than probably it was ever before. And so we continue to fundraise during the pandemic, even though we're not seeing as many applications. So if you'll go into slide eight, um, you'll see that actually over the last year, REAPS received $9 million um, into that fund. Um, $7 million of that came from a, a program called Project WARM that was a partnership with the city of San Antonio. And the REAP board voted to take those funds and put them into REAP because Project WARM was just limited to helping people during the cold months. And we wanted the flexibility of being able to help the same group of people whenever they needed it. So in addition to that, we've done a lot of creativity. Um, we've applied for a, a grant through Methodist Healthcare Ministries. Our employees continue to fundraise. We, um, we've done a text to give campaign with the community that was um, really actually um, quite successful. And in, when we weren't in the pandemic years, we had an annual girls giving fundraiser that we did with our community that helped raise a lot of money for that program as well. So we go to slide nine. And I know I'm talking fast, but I really am trying to get through this quickly so that you can ask questions if you have them. Um, our Burned Veterans Discount Program is the only program that, or that one and a similar one called our First Responders with Burned Injuries Discount Program are the only ones that you can't stack with affordability discounts. And that's just because they get this discount of up to $94 from the months of April to October. It's more than the affordability discount program discount, but the rest of the months they get ADP as well. So they get both, it's just not in the same month. But this helps um, customers who've been in, burned in combat who can't regulate their temperature to get a discount on their electricity bill during the months when it's hotter. And as you can see here, we spend about $20,000 a year on this program. 
And on slide 10, you can just see the view of customers who participate by council district. On slide 11, this is our Casa Verde weatherization program, which Rudy stole my thunder. <laughs> so I hope, um, some of the talking points that I wanted to make, um, but we'll, we'll go into it a little bit. Um, this program, customers um, actually only have to be at 200% of the federal poverty level, so there's a little more wiggle room there where we can help customers. Um, once a customer applies and meets the income qualifications, we actually do a, an in-home assessment to make sure that to determine what measures will be installed and to make sure that the home is structurally sound. So you'll see here that prior to the pandemic, oh, let's go to the next slide and see the numbers. There we go. Um, you'll see that prior to the pandemic, we spent about $20 million a year on this program. Um, during the pandemic, we had to pause the program until Jesse could work closely with our vendor to make sure that we had a way to enter people's homes safely. Um, so we, you'll see the numbers fluctuating, and that's the reason why they're fluctuating. But Rudy mentioned earlier that CPS Energy spends about $4,500 per home installing these energy efficiency measures, and we see an average reduction of about $30 to $40 a month on a customer's energy bill once, it's, once their home has been weatherized. So if you'll go to slide 13, you'll be able to see the homes weatherized by city council district. I'm sure this is um, this one in particular is probably very interesting because we talked about the energy burden and the parts of town where these measures are um, making a significant impact. If you'll go to slide 14, uh, this is our senior citizens billing program. It allows customers that qualify additional time to pay their bill. As you know, many of these customers are dependent on Social Security or other retirement income, and this program offers their needed flexibility. Slide 15. Uh, is a similar program as our Disabled Citizens Billing Program also offers the additional flexibility um, and timing to pay their bill. And I think this program and the previous program are really important because it just shows that we're, we're trying to find equitable solutions for various customers within our population and meet them, um, you know, meet their needs where they are instead of trying to fit them into a mold that, you know, we've predetermined. If you'll go to slide 16, Many of our customers rely on electric powered life sustaining equipment. So we have our critical care customer program that offers those participants also additional time to pay their bill. But in addition to that, customers who are experiencing outages that are on this program will get personalized phone calls from my team to talk about the time of the outage, how long it's gonna last and discuss with them if they need to make additional arrangements for their life sustaining equipment. So that's a, just a personalized outreach that we do for customers in that particular program. And that was my last slide. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody in the chat. Uh, Anne, is there anybody in the room? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Brenda has a question. I'm headed her way. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I had read it earlier and it was very easy to understand, so I, I appreciate that. But I, I don't have a question, I have a recommendation. Uh, considering that we're still in pandemic mode and many folks uh, are going home and still having to rely on oxygen energy, um, perhaps you, should, you all should consider giving them as much uh, discount um, as you do burn veterans, because now they're having to uh, potentially use those those tanks maybe now for the rest of their lives and so now they are i think should be considered uh, a family that has an energy burden so maybe you all could consider that thank you that's um that's a really great feedback and i know that we are always willing to take feedback and and see where we can incorporate it so thanks for sharing that idea with us and peter has a question or comment oh yes Mr. Peter. on the um the ADP, Casa Verde, and the REAP, you know, that you describe them as three different and that people can participate in, in each one. As far as the data that you have related to that, I saw in the last presentation, last um, meeting, where it showed 52,000 individuals were on the ADP. And so does that include, I'm assuming it doesn't include these other programs. So when we talk about identifying that low income, well, it's customer, what is that hard number? Hard number of low income of customers. Low income just related to if it's ADP, does the weatherization also because they qualify 
under the uh, income requirements, they would also be considered the low income customer. Yes. Does that make sense? It does. So one of the things that my team does, in addition to connecting customers with all the programs in San Antonio, we also do everything that we can to connect our customers with all the programs that we have. So if someone applies for the ADP program, we will encourage them to apply for the other programs that they qualify for. In addition would also be weatherization if they own their own home. Just to clarify the question. So if we were looking to identify the number of low income customers that we have data on, what would that number be? If the slide showed 52,000, but yeah, we have these other two programs. I just want to be sure it's the whole number. So we're actually getting that data from several different sources because we don't have access. To, CPS Energy doesn't have access to customers' income. That's not one of the data points that we ask for. So we have to get that information from other sources. But you're probably looking at the city of San Antonio, if you look at our overall population, you'd say probably 20% or more of the population, right, would qualify as a low income customer. Right, but as a metric, that would be, if you qualified, we're gonna consider you not range, not giving a range of to what degree you are low income, but it is still categorized as a low income customer. If, if that's the metric that we're trying to, to identify. Does that make sense? Maybe someone can help me because I'm still not yeah, understanding. I, 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 this is Rudy. I'm, I'm trying. I, let me see if I can kind of hone in on your on your point. Rudy, I, you know, can you speak a little louder because you're sounding really distant? Okay, I'm sorry. I think I'm having a bad connection. Is is that any better? Is that any better? It's a little bit better. Okay. Um. So. Not every, you know, obviously not every low income customer is signed up for ADP. And so um, to KJ's point, I think, um, you know, every rate case, though, you know, Eloise and I had this conversation prepping for the meeting. You know, the, the, the concept of energy burden, you know, really hasn't been a topic of conversation in the context of a rate case because we have been in for a rate case, you know, in the last, you know, once in the last decade. Over which the you know the utility burden concept has really you know uh, come into into the conversation. So our our approach has always been affordability, and it's budgeted, and you know, and we have uh, you know, and we fund it to a certain number of customers. Um, there are certainly more customers that are low income that are on our affordability program. I, you know, we we probably need to do a little work to define how many customers we think are eligible that in our community above and beyond uh, who are on the ADP uh, as part of this conversation. But but as KJ said, you know, we, we got to work with partners to get to that number, but not but not every low income customer, you know, is is on ADP. You know, I, I, I think that's kind of the point you're making. Yes, Rudy, it's identifying the, the question. For the sake of data development, that, that's what we would need in order to conduct the analysis and uh, ultimately a study or a pilot program. So that's that's my reason for asking the question. So I would request for CPS to provide that information or try to get that information if we're serious about looking at identifying the low income customer so that we can address them properly when, when and if the rate increase impacts them. We will know we at least have the group to that will actually be studying. That's my that's my reason for asking the question. So yes, we sir. Can, I got, I got you. For okay. us to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I would also suggest that the data, a lot of the data that you're talking about is available at the city of San Antonio. The Office of Equity had been doing a lot of work to really pull a lot of that data and then also put it publicly on their website. So I think that this could be a, a collaboration effort uh, between the city uh, and CPS. Um, I don't see any other questions and I know we're almost at, we're at three minutes, so I'm going to jump in and I have three kind Pardon of. Me. Wait, we do have one more question. How's that thought? Okay, go for it. I, I want to. Yeah, I think you turned it off. No, no, it looks like it's on. Try okay. To... All right. Sorry. On the uh, ADP program, 
Did you say that it's uh, $12.36? A month. It's up, it's up to $12.36 a month if they have electric and gas. Got it. Um, one other question that I had asked via um, email was uh, for, and, and um, Louisa kind of touched on this, uh, sample bills for all classes of uh, residential. Um, we were showed the RE, but not the RA or RCE. W would we still be able to? That was a, a question for you, Katie. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> this is a general question, that, and that's all my questions. Yes, you can still get that. We'll get you that information. Yes, ma'am. To to the rack, but not on the website. Okay. Well, I would rather email versus like having to go to the website to see it. I can do that. Okay, Eloise. So now you can have it. Thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, I have two minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through. I have three major questions. Um, is there a way that we can streamline these kinds of programs, like some of the other cities where they're tying it to a access to WIC, right, or access to um, uh, um, uh, the Lone Star or 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 uh, uh, food assistance or rental assistance, so that there is a, a reduced barrier and a more streamlined? Because almost everything that you listed involved having people actually do that initiative. And we've already discussed the 12 and a half percent illiteracy rate. We've discussed, uh, you know, language barriers. We've discussed uh, access and barriers to technology. And so really thinking about how do we streamline that? And then the other uh, major question or two, two major questions is that from this presentation, this is what I'm walking away with. I'm walking away that there's two discount programs and it looks like four different uh, payment programs. So it's like we have two programs to, to actually provide some relief, but we have four different ways for y'all to pay your bill. And only one of those payment programs involves waiving late fees. So it makes me think that there are a lot of wait, wait, uh, late fees that are accumulating on many other uh, people that are not are on behind on their bills. And so I am seeing that there's literally two discount programs, the bill assistance that's up to a million dollars on the CPS side and um, the four different payment plan programs or support supporting the payment part of it. And then we have the weatherization program, Casa Verde. Um, I'm also just going to question now the actual amounts because in the affordability discount, we have 52,000 and a half people uh, taking advantage of that. And that rate, the actual affordability, taking your 12 uh, dollar number, you multiply those two things together and we're talking up to maybe 600,000, but the slide deck is showing, you know, uh, a lot more money, a lot more cost for that program. And in fact, it has it as at 4.5 million. Uh, so if 600,000 are just going directly to the affordability discount, where is the other $4 million? What does that go to? And I would say the same thing for the burn vet discount. We have 32 uh, customers, only 32 customers participating in that burn discount that they get only for a few months a year. And they are going to benefit those 32 benefit a, a total of like $3,000. So where's the other, what, 13, a uh, hundred dollars uh, going to right because it's sixteen thousand in terms of cost up to date for twenty twenty two. If we only have thirty uh, two customers and they're only getting about ninety four dollars each, where's all the rest? Where does all the rest of that funds? What is that going to? Or what? Is, where? Do, where are those costs? And um, I feel the same thing, same way around the weatherization program. They may be getting five thousand dollars worth of benefits. For 960 uh, customers, but that comes out to about 4.8 million dollars in direct services. So where does direct benefit? So really wanting to also understand what what is that overhead or where does that additional funding uh, needs for those programs um, come into play? And with that, we're over two minutes. And I know you can't answer all my questions, but I really want to. I, I can't. I can't answer one. This is Amelia Batters. Um, I'm familiar most with the ADP program, but that is the $12 a month. So that $624,000 is a month. So that's how you get to your 7.2 million. Those are total dollars that go to discounts for the customer. Um, 
I'll have to look into the answers for the other programs I'm less familiar with. Thank you. That would be really helpful to understand. What is the, the overhead? What is going directly to customers? And then what is the additional overhead? And that kind of is going to this point that I'm trying to make is that we've created all these barriers and processes to, um, I call them barriers, other people may call them processes, to actually re get relief and benefits to those low-income folks. And so if, if we could really just start to cut out this middleman and provide direct relief instead of developing more programs that cost a lot of money to have overhead, pro you know, the overhead on those programs and really providing direct relief to residents that need it the most. So with that, I know that we didn't get cover everything, but we are at time. I want to thank all of you for your, your patience and your attention. Um, look forward to meeting you all. Uh, I think it's next week, right? Yes, ma'am. Next Thursday, three to six, it will be in person and virtual. Awesome. Thank you everybody. Thank, thank you. you.